Thank you, Chair. The meeting is now live. Thank you. Well, good evening, everybody. And I'd like to welcome everyone to this remote meeting of the Planning Committee. Please note that the meeting is being broadcast and recorded. Please also note the normal rules of, of debate apply, including the requirement for any member to be present for the duration of the whole debate. So if any member is absent for any part of the debate, then you must abstain from voting. We're expecting speakers to talk to agenda item six on the agenda. Um, and I'd like to extend a welcome to you, Ms. Madden. Um, please, can you at this moment while we're live, uh, confirm that you're present when I call your name? So Ms. Madden, can you just unmute and just confirm that we can still hear you? Yes, I'm present, thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, as I get to the relevant item, I will explain to you what will happen um, at, at that time. Now, to the first item on the agenda, are there any apologies for absence? Thank you, Chair. I've received apologies from Councillor Skinner and Councillor Mrs Matic. Thank you. Is any other member bringing apologies? Okay. Members of the committee, please turn on your microphone and confirm you are present only when Hannah calls your name. Please do not turn your cameras on at this point. Anyone who doesn't respond will be recorded as giving their apologies. Hannah. Thank you. Councillor Angel. Present. Councillor Dr Barnard. Present. Councillor Bandari. Present. Councillor Birch. Present. Councillor Brossard. Present. Councillor Brown. Present. Councillor Dudley. Present. Councillor Badibo. Present. Councillor Green. Present. Councillor Mrs Hayes. Present. Councillor Hayden. Present. Councillor Mrs Mackenzie. Present. Councillor Mrs Mackenzie Boyle. Present. Councillor Mossum. Present. Councillor Parker. Present. And Councillor Virgo. Present. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other, other members, not of the members of the planning committee in attendance? If so, please turn on your microphone and confirm your presence when Anna calls your name. So I can see Councillor Mrs. Ms. Gore. Present. And Councillor Tarrell. Present. Thank you. If your name hasn't been called and you're here, please can you let us know now? Thank you. Agenda item two is to approve as a correct record the minutes of the meeting of the committee held on the 18th of March. Before I ask Councillor Brassard to second the motion, please indicate in the meetings chat if you have an issue with the accuracy. Um, I believe Councillor, um, is it Councillor Gore that gave me? In, in fact, Mr. McKenzie, I believe, who oh, yes. did Council record her apologies. Yes. Can we record Councillor McKenzie's apologies? So I think she did give them to me. If they weren't recorded, I apologise. But uh, if we can alter that to show that Councillor McKenzie was um, was sending apologies for that meeting. No problem. I'll make that amendment. Thank you. So with that amendment, Councillor Brossard, are you happy to second that motion? I am indeed, Chairman. Thank you very much indeed. Um, if any other member has a problem with the minutes or wishes to vote against or abstain, please let me know now in the meetings chat. I will take that as read. Now, the full text of declarations of interest is set out on the agenda item three. If any member has a disclosable pecuniary interest or an effective interest to declare, please indicate and I'll come to you in turn. Thank nobody is declaring an interest. Uh, the fourth item on the agenda is the consideration of any urgent items. Hannah, are no, there any? None notified, Thank Chair. Thank you. So we move on then to agenda item five on the agenda, which is land adjacent to 18 Lion Oaks, Warfield. Uh, application to fell four trees. Yeah, and if you could now turn your camera on and unmute and give us your presentation, please. Thank you. Good evening, Chair. Good evening, all. Um, I take it I'm visible and you can hear me? 
Yes, indeed. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to draw members' attention to the supplementary report provided uh, regarding uh, information from the Great Oaks Management Company Limited that own the land on which the four trees are growing. Um, I'd like to uh, remind the committee that you're not determining uh, uh, an a development application relating to trees, nor are you uh, confirming a tree preservation order. This is uh, quite unusual. This is a determination of a tree work application on four trees that have been protected and the tree preservation order was confirmed several years ago. Um, if I may set the scene for this, this issue goes back as far as 1975. This was the first year after the insurance industry um, included subsidence damage in their buildings insurance policies. And would you believe it, in 1975, this was the first drought year or event year uh, when an, an awful lot of subsidence claims were made. And there's been no turning back since. And this has turned into an industry of its own in some respects, um, whereby properties that have subsidence induced by vegetation, namely trees, make a claim against the tree owners uh, in order to settle the, the actual claim. If I may now show the presentation, I'll talk you through that. Members have these uh, in the appendix associated with the item itself, but if I may talk through this uh, appendix, um, it hopefully will um, assist members in understanding the situation. On screen, you have an extract from the Tree Preservation Order Plan, TPO 89, which was made in uh, 1991 and confirmed in the same year. Circled in red, is the group of four oak trees that are the subject of this, of this uh, item. On. Members can see that this was a tree preservation order made uh, in the pre-development context, um, some five years ahead of actual planning applications to develop this area. For members' benefit, this is the, these are the grouping of trees to the side of 18 lion oaks. Um, this is Quelm Lane, as we know it, and this parcel of protected woodland is now known as Piggy Wood. This plan shows in detail that road lay prizing of Lion Oaks, Derby Vale and uh, Faithful Close Price Gardens. The four oak trees at issue. The land which they occupy is, um, is owned by the Great Oaks Management Company Limited. And it's a, a, a number of small pieces of amenity open space throughout the development, which contain the protected trees subject to tree, TPO 89. For example, there's a grouping of trees here, and there are uh, oak trees uh, along here and down here and along Derby Vale. These trees were identified in process in 1996 for 101 houses in that development. The records show that the trees were acknowledged as a material consideration and sufficiently important to be listed as significantly important trees and that details of the development were changed to accommodate the presence of these trees. For members' benefit, there's an aerial shot of the site, the same grouping of trees and others that are part of Tree Preservation Order 89.
presentation, uh, Chair, to um, talk through some of the pertinent points of the report. But what you can see in front of you is a view of the grouping of four oak trees to the side of 18 lion oaks. <clears throat> the application is to remove these four trees because the, they have been determined to be implicated in subsidence damage to the foundations of 18 lion oaks. The application is to remove all four trees because that is the expected emphatic solution of the insurance company in addressing the uh, legal nuisance that the trees are uh, presenting to the damage uh, of the foundations. The application is for the removal. There are, no, there are no other considerations made by the applicant in terms of other solutions. Um, there were a number of representations, 56 in total from the public. Uh, all bar two were an objection to the removal of the, uh, the oak trees. Four of those objections. The summary of objections are itemized or listed in summary at item 4.2 in the report. I won't go through them in detail, but I would summarize them. The tone of most of the objections uh, conveyed a, a sense of outrage at the loss of four oak trees in the environment, which are obviously valued by those particular persons that made uh, a representation. They were picked up and identified as part of the development application process back in 1997, the 101 dwellings. They were identified as, quote, very important feature trees um, as part of G3 of TPO 89. Details of those uh, planning references are in Appendix 8 of this report. Um, in determining applications uh, such as these, the council able loss or any damage, which is a material consideration, alongside other considerations, such as the amenity value of the trees, the justification of the proposed works, and whether there might be any alternative solutions to the structural damage to buildings. All these must be weighed up before reaching a final decision. Details of the risk um, that uh, the refusal of this application might um, bring upon the council are listed in section 6.4. I don't propose to go into that in any great detail. It's probably a bit beyond my remit because it's based on insurance risk but there is an insurance officer available to answer any particular questions in that respect. The biodiversity officer has identified the value of this grouping of trees and her eagle eyes also spotted a flock of starlings in the canopy of one of the trees in one of these photographs. I think there may be a prize chair for any member that can actually spot those trees in any of these photographs. Uh, and that the biodiversity officer summarized by saying that the removal of these trees would eliminate all the ecological benefits they provide. And it is doubtful whether any new planting, which would be a typical condition attached to a permission to remove protected trees, any new planting would achieve the same, even, uh, same effect even after many decades. Subsidence occurs as a result of vegetation induced extraction of water within shrinkable clay soils. The aim of this type is normally supported by a range of technical reports provided by the claimant that has tested aspects of the species of tree involved, whether or not the soil is indeed shrinkable, whether or not there are any other obvious defects that might explain the movement of soil, for example, faulty drains, any significant geological differences or anomalies in that location, and things like soil analysis, which shows that the soils have been dried out, 
and that their recovery would indeed uh, can be achieved or, or not as the case may be. And then we have engineers uh, comments uh, explaining the damage caused to the property. And finally, something which is really uh, uh, important, if not more important than most of the other reports put together, which is the level monitoring. Level monitoring is a fairly modern system whereby points, um, nails, if you will, are, are uh, affixed to the lower part of the, the building, probably around the um, damp course level. And their movement through a season is compared to that of a fixed point, which is normally a steel rod sunk into the ground several meters away, but it's sunk so deep into the ground that it doesn't actually move. So then the difference between the top of that steel pin and the movement of the other markers around the foundations of the house, that movement, and when monitored, can be measured very accurately and can be demonstrating the movement of that part of the building in relation to the season of the year. Typically during the summer season when trees are at their most active in terms of their growth, that's when they will be extracting most water from the soil. And that's when one can expect their level monitoring readings to show the most significant amplitude of movement. I move on at this stage to some more views of the tree. Left hand side, we have the grouping of four oaks. In fact, if members eagle eye spotted the, there's a fifth oak in the background. This is just for information, but it's not protected. This is the fifth oak, it's not protected. I cannot explain why the records of the tree preservation order don't explain why it wasn't protected. I can only assume because of that area of damage at the base of the tree it was decided it probably wouldn't be sustainable in terms of long-term protection. Here we have a plan view of the location of the trees and their distance from various points on the side of the building. This gives an impression of the proximity of the trees. By virtue of their species characteristic, oaks can send roots for um, growing in significant distances. And the insurance industry considers that the distances shown here are well within the parameters of influence by oak, of oak tree on foundations. The dashed line that members can see is actually the expected position of any root barrier that might be installed to prevent any further damage by roots to the foundations of the house. I'll come to the details of the root barrier later on. The insurance industry's primary um, responsibility is to their claimant in, in the respect of abating the nuisance, preventing it from occurring and repairing the damage. On the abatement side, their solution is to remove the tree. It's an emphatic solution because once the tree is removed, if it was seasonally induced damage, there is nothing else for them to be able to rely on that would cause uh, the continuing damage to the property. So removal of trees is the preferred solution. There are arboricultural solutions and our engineering solutions as alternatives to the removal of the trees. An arboricultural solution would be to very heavily prune the trees. Uh, if you imagine giving them a, a very hard pruning to reduce the majority of the canopy cover. This would reduce the extent of foliage, which in turn reduces the amount of water extracted by the tree's root system in the soil that it's enjoying, uh, it, that it is growing in. The problem with the arboricultural solution is the research carried out indicates that the extent of pruning would be so significant, some 70 to 90% 
of the volume of the crown structure, that this would inevitably cause harm to the tree by virtue of causing extensive and large pruning cuts. And in respect of the purpose of the tree preservation order, it would negate that because it would alter the visual amenity and appearance of the tree that is the basis for imposing a tree preservation order in the first place. And to boot, using that technique, it would be required to be repeated on a three to four year basis in order to actively prevent or manage the removal of soil water by the tree roots. The alternative solution is an engineering solution, which is the point where we, uh, we refer to the root barrier. A root barrier is a technical uh, specialist membrane. It used to be concrete in the old days, but nowadays it's specially woven. It even contains copper, uh, which interferes with the root's ability to function. So it's sort of a, it's a chemical barrier as well, to a degree. Uh, it's a technically woven uh, membrane that is inserted to a depth of, well, however many meters is required to reach the underside of the foundations of the property. That then is a physical barrier between the roots of the tree and the soil in which the foundations of the affected property are growing. That is an accepted solu engineering solution to abate the nuisance of subsidence caused by trees. The tree service has considered that option, although it wasn't part of the application, and has determined that the space between the foundations, as depicted on this uh, diagram, the space between the foundations and the majority of the rooting system of the trees would allow for the installation of a root barrier. And an application to the council on that basis to install a root barrier would not be unreasonably refused. At this stage, members may be minded to ask themselves, well, what is the value of these trees? The insurance industry, because it's an industry of, uh, fu fundamentally based on finances, can readily, and in this case has readily provided a figure of £125,000 or thereabouts, that would be the cost of repairing the damage to the property. For many, many years, and the uh, local authorities have not been able necessarily to put a value on amenity. In fact, there is no definition of that, even provided by the government and the legislation that enables us to make tree preservation orders. However, for certainly 30 years now, there has been an opportunity to value trees, to put a value on them by virtue of their impact in landscape, character, appearance and amenity. There are two systems. One is called the Heliwell system, EAT. The tree service has applied both these methodologies to these trees and in both cases the figure is just shy of a quarter of a million pounds, as, which is the amenity value that these trees provide in that landscape. In conclusion, I'm summing up here, but there are still a few more slides to go through to explain the technical details. The four oaks are found to be in good health and condition. They have a long expected, useful expected life ahead of them, given the appropriate treatment. They are highly significant as, part, as G3 as part of Tree Preservation Order 89. They are valued by the local residents. A grant of permission to remove these four oaks would normally be conditional on replacement trees being planted. However, the number of and choice of species to be replanted would be affected by the council's knowledge of the extant incidence of subsidence and the foreseeability of a reoccurrence of subsidence damage as the newly planted trees mature, grow larger, and possibly have that 
effect subs of causing subsidence to the property. So in taking that into account, the planning authority would have to consider alternative species of trees, more ornamental, let's say smaller trees that would never grow to the same size as the current oaks and therefore reducing the risk of any subsidence reoccurring. The removal of the four protected trees is not the only practical solution to the subsidence. The installation of a root barrier would provide a solution to the problem caused by the growth of the roots near the foundations of 18 lion oaks. By choosing this alternative engineering solution, the trees would be retained and the character of the landscape and the high quality of visual amenity afforded to the public at large by the retention of the four oaks would be and conclude now by covering some of the technical aspects and then I'll be opening up to up to questions. This plan shows the location of the trees. The plan is extracted from one of the reports provided by the applicant. It shows the location of the trial pits or boreholes dug to carry out the soil investigations. This dashed line is the area of damage as this is and the trial pits and boreholes would have been dug to a level ideally below the foundation depth. Soil samples would have been taken to be sent to the laboratory for testing to see if they are shrinkable. And at the same time, any roots that would be found in these holes would be sent away for analysis and identification. This is an example of level monitoring data. This shows at the bottom of the, the, the axis down here, it shows the dates in which the uh, measurements were taken. And on this axis, the distance or the, the amount of movement in millimeters along through the growing season. So one might typically expect that um, in the peak of the growing season, the magnitude of uh, cracks or, or, or movement on these level monitoring points opens up because from the ground and the soil is therefore moving and therefore the foundations move with them. This is more graphic uh, extrapolation of that level monitoring. The diagram shows the footprint of the house itself. The numbers are the level monitoring points used to record the movement. The different colors are representative of the dates in which the readings were made. And this graphic illustration shows, it may only be millimeters, but this is the magnitude of movement that is being experienced by the foundations. The critical point here is that this level monitoring presented like this demonstrates clearly that the side of the house or the foundations closest to the oak trees is where the most movement is occurring. Trees in subsidence to this particular property. Uh, Chairman, um, I, I think I'll conclude there, but I am open obviously to, to, uh, to questions in that respect. Thank you for that very comprehensive um, presentation again. Uh, members, if you have any questions, if you could let me know in the chat box. And the first question I have is from Councillor Bandari. Thank you, Chair. And uh, Jan, amazing presentation. Very well summarised, I think, for those of us not very versed with the details of um, uh, tree science, you know, very, very helpful. So thanks for that, first of all. Um, so, so, so you might be aware that sort of, you know, I was... Uh, I was approached with regards to this, this application and there is some, some history I'm aware of. There is one um, point that was suggested that there are some extra building works in this particular property, which might or might not be approved, I'm not sure. But do you think those building works- So my, my, my apologies, if I could interrupt, you dropped out there. I think it's the problem is at my end. So I'm sorry, could you repeat the question, please? Sure, yeah, no worries. No, I'm, uh, I just wanted to share that. I, it has been brought to my notice that there are potentially some extra building works on this property, which might or might not be uh, approved. I'm not too sure on that. But do you think the magnitude of building works 
on this particular house, which is 80 million rocks, could have also contributed to this um, particular challenge with substance? Uh, my understanding is that there were applications, it's in the report, the actual application numbers, but uh, the the certainly any um, extensions or, or, or development to the house were carried out um, uh, under approval and were taken into account. I am not aware of any works to the property that might add to the issue of subsidence. Okay, sure, no worries. No, we can we can look at that. And and second question is, um, so you mentioned starlings. I think it was also mentioned there are potentially bats nesting in these oaks. And um, we're not sure about the nesting, uh, councillor. It's entirely possible that they may be used as roosts um, as they uh, uh, during during the course of their feeding uh, at, at, at in the evenings. But whether or not there are actually roosts would be subject to a detailed investigation uh, by a trained uh, officer. Sure. Uh, Chair, just one final question, if I may. Thank um. you. So. Uh, Jan, you know, uh, you mentioned the, the cost, which is 125,000 to put the root barrier work. So, so there is a solution, which is the root barrier works, which can, which can put, potentially prevent felling these four beautiful trees. So that 125,000 cost, that is not to us, but the loss of quarter of a million is to the council. Is that if, if I may clarify, uh, uh, councillor, the figure of 125,000 that's uh, uh, mentioned in the report is the figure that the insurance company who made this application are stating would be the cost of required repairs. This is a summary figure. It does contains no details of what that value actually consists of. Sure, sure. No, no, my, my, absolutely. Thank you for that. My point is that that is sort of, you know, a transactional value between the insurance company and the house owner, but, but the potential loss to our bara, to our council, to our residents, uh, with the quantification that you provided is more than quarter of a million pounds. So that was to us. That is correct, sir. If um, if you have to compare costs, then uh, this is why the, the matter is before the committee of a potential claim for compensation. But the, the only way of compar comparing and uh, to enable a decision to be made is to, to use the figures presented. And the trees have been valued at a quarter of a million pounds. Thank you, Jan. <clears throat> Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Bandari. Councillor Brown. Thank you, Chair. Um, I have a couple of questions, if I may, related. Um, what, what, if, if trees are removed, that many trees, um, in a smallish location, would the ground also move with that or change in some way? I, uh, I'm sorry if I could interrupt again. I dropped out again. I did. Oh, I missed sorry. the first part. Yeah, um, I've lost you slightly. Oh, there. Um, if if the tr trees are if four trees are removed from that piece of ground, is the uh, ground going to change such that the house will move in that case as well and um, what would be the effect on the next door house with or without the trees please right um i, I think what you're referring to councillor is, is is sometimes referred to as soil heave which in crude terms is the reverse of subsidence if the four trees are removed there is a, a risk yet to be quantified by the insurance company that if the four trees are indeed removed, that over time the soil re-wets, it normalises, and because it's a shrinkable clay, again it will move, it will expand this time, let's say, the reverse of subside, and that in its own way could cause additional damage to the foundations and structure of the house whether or not it would be sufficient to affect the neighboring property to number 18, the next house along, um, that indeed would be a, a consideration by an engineer. I, I don't, I'm afraid I don't have the expertise to answer that uh, in, in full. Thank you, that's great. Thank you, Councillor Brown. Um, 
I've got no other questions listed. I, I've got one, one question here. Um, although the um, evidence that's been submitted, especially with regard to this graphic you have on the screen at the moment, shows that there is a certain amount of movements of the foundations. Um, what it doesn't show is that whether or not this movement is being affected or, or being uh, caused by one of the trees or all four of the trees. Is that correct? <laughs> yes, Chair, that, that is correct. Um, let's see. The ability for either the applicant or in this case, the council to differentiate between the four trees is impossible. Again, a bit of history. Um, there is no predictive model or equation that could be utilized in any way, shape or form that would categorically be able to identify which tree of any number near a building is actually the primary cause or a contributor to subsidence. We don't have that level of sophistication. It doesn't exist, it's unlikely to exist. What we do know is that oak roots were found in the trial pit holes as shown on one of the slides, that all the four trees to the side of the property are indeed oak. There would be a DNA test that could be applied, but even that is not emphatic because if the four oaks were of the same genetic provenance, in other words, the same clan family, and that is highly likely because if members recall, they, uh, I showed a slide where they were shown um, uh, as part of tree preservation order um, 89, growing in a field effectively, they were field grown oaks. Therefore, it is highly likely that they are um, cousins for want of a description. So the acorns could have come from the yes. same tree that caused the caused the four trees or five trees to grow. Um, I missed the, the start of your sentence. Uh, I said so that. the so the, you know for, so the acorns that um, that these trees grew from because as we know oaks grow from acorns they they could have been fallen from the same tree and exactly exactly brothers or cousins or yeah or, or siblings. Exactly that. So a DNA yeah. test to try and determine which of the four might be implicated or connected to the roots found in the trial pit holes would not prove necessarily that it is one oak and not the other. Thank you. Councillor Hayden, sorry I missed your hand. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, Jan. The... Uh, I, I suspect I'm nearly as passionate about protecting oak trees as you are. Could somebody re-clarify the legal position and the threat to the council? Because I thought uh, in the papers that um, um, any action taken before uh, the action to, to remove the TPO were not, were not liable. Um, it's... I'm confused as to what you know why we should be liable. Isn't this why householders have insurance, um, and it's just the insurance company trying to recover their costs? Uh, indeed, in in essence, the insurance claim would be between the injured party, in other words, eighteen lion oaks, and the owner of the trees, which is the Great Oaks Management Company Limited. The reason that the report is before committee is that because the trees are protected, the council has to make a determination if the application to remove is justified. The regulations governing tree preservation order legislation allow for the ability for a person who makes an application that is, uh, can demonstrate quantifiable loss uh, as a result of the council's decision has the ability to make a claim for compensation. But the regulations would only allow that quantity of damage to be calculated from the date or point at which the council made the would refuse the application. It is then for the claimant, if they so choose to make that claim for compensation, to demonstrate the amount of loss and to justify it 
that would then then it would be considered as part of the process. Thank you, Jan. Thank you. Vice Chair, Councillor Brossard. Yeah, thank you for that. Apologies, Chairman, for not being able to use the chat function. I think there may be That's a problem okay. with the U with the USB connections. Yeah, and in the report on page 15, 3.9, there's a reference to the um, repairs totaling very close to £127,000. Now, I assume that that figure excludes the engineering solution that you had described. But more specifically, um, if that is related to, shall we say, uh, fragmentation of the brickwork or the plaster or doors not aligning. Have we had any photographs or any narrative that actually sets out how that figure has been arrived at? So we do not. We have no details of, the, of what the breakdown of that cost is. In my experience, I might offer an assumption that that is the total cost of which the, the primary part of it would be, um, for example, underpinning to prevent any further movement of the property. But what that figure is actually uh, uh, made up of, I'm afraid we weren't party to that information and we can only assume it's be, it'd be the total costs of investigation, the digging of the trial pit holes, for example, right through to the actual repairs of the foundations of the house. Okay. Uh, well, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Ballyboy. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Ian. Uh, with the co I, I had a question about the cost, and uh, I think that's been asked already, but a follow-on would, why have the insurance company refused to send us or share the date, uh, the details of the breakdown of that cost? Uh, can I, can uh, I just say, I, I don't think that's a planning consideration here. Um, what we have to look at is, is pure planning considerations rather than the economic costs to either the insurance company um, or um, the insurers of Great Oaks Management Corporation or whatever they're called. I'm sorry, I forget their name. <laughs> um, I, I think that what we've got to do here is just look at whether or not um, this, uh, this application, this recommendation, um, whether we should remove the pre preservation order. I don't think there is a financial implication that we should really get into at this moment in time. Well, uh, uh, Chair, I, I think I disagree with that. Uh, the reason okay. is here is we have to consider the planning implication of following, but also is here because of the potential legal cost mm -hmm. to the council. I'm assuming yeah. that's part of the reason. So it is financial. Uh, we have to consider that. And my question, and the reason why I'm asking this question is, to me, it sounds like the cheapest alternative is just to cut the trees. Now, I would have loved to see a comparison between cutting the trees, installing, for example, I don't know how much it will cost to install a typical, uh, you mentioned root barrier, for example, as an engineering solution. So I, I don't, in order for me to weigh the consequences of saying, uh, or uh, what's it called, uh, agreeing to the officer's recommendation against the cost and the cost to the council and the cost to the insurance company. This These figures are important to see, I think. Uh, yeah, I, I can offer some, I can shed some light on some of the uh, question that uh, Councillor Debedo is aunt, uh, asking, if you if you, if you allow yeah, me. Please, yeah. yeah. Right. Um, in discussions with the Great Oaks Management Company prior to this report, um, the, the uh, discussions revolved around options and, and likely solutions to the, to the actual issue. Because ultimately the, the interest of the Great Oaks Management Company is, well, if the council, whatever the council's decision is, what are we gonna end up having to deal with? Um, and I was able to uh, explain through my knowledge of uh, such cases what the likely scenarios might be. Uh, we did cover the point about um, the cheapest option, as the councillor mentioned, and indeed um, 
Great Oaks Management Company Limited did get quotations uh, for the removal of the trees. And I believe it was somewhere between five and six thousand pounds maximum. Uh, that's the cheapest solution. The next solution, which was the installation of a root barrier, they got indications from their contractor of what that might be, and that was running in the region of about £25,000. That's an estimation. It's not a, an accurate fixed quote, but an estimation. So those are the two figures at the lowest end of the scale in terms of how the insurance industry might consider its approach as I said, because at five, six thousand pounds to remove the trees, that is the preferred methodology of the insurers is get rid of the trees, one gets rid of the problem. After that, the options are the engineering solutions, and that's when it starts to become more expensive. The root barrier in the region of 25,000 pounds, we think. After that, if it's not a root barrier, the only remaining solutions are the more uh, expensive engineering solutions, such as underpinning the foundations. And that is typically why the, the vast um, proportion of that 126,000 pound figure may indeed be an to stabilize the property. Thank you. So I, I just, just to go back to my original question with regards to that fee, why, as the insurance company refused to share that detail what came about that figure with you? I, I can only assume, uh, Chair, that that's commercially sensitive information. Um, and they do, are not prepared to share the details of that because of the potential that if the, uh, the, of the, the matter of the compensation claim. So they're keeping their powder dry for want of a description. It's commercially sensitive information. They choose not to share it. Thank you. Uh, Chair, if I just, if I may continue, uh, how long do you, uh, in your ex experience and with your uh, vast knowledge, how long does the trees, sorry, the roots grow every year for a typical oak tree of that age? Wow. Um, A, any, any tree root will take advantage of the right growing conditions. If it's able to penetrate a soil, and um, we're talking, you know, the, the general range of soils, everything from sandy to clay, if it can grow a root in that sort of soil, and in the course of growing that root, obtain water from that soil and nutrients, then it will continue to ascend out exploratory routes as far as it reasonably can. And that may be some distance, but one could be surprised at the extent at which roots grow. What stops them is a physical impenetrable barrier, such as um, the foundations of a house. But if the foundations are not deep enough, the roots can grow underneath that and continue to grow. Another impenetrable barrier would be um, the root barrier that I mentioned, um, which would prevent the roots from growing any further and in growing any further around the foundations would prevent the activity of the soil moisture extraction from the soil, which causes it to shrink. So it's as long as it's tall in a sense, Council, I'm afraid I, I, there is no, again, no equation. It depends very much on the growing environment and the ability for roots to grow through that soil. Thank you. Just one last uh, question then from my side. Uh, you, you mentioned that the, the slide, the last slide you showed us has uh, monitoring data. I take it that is from an independent person? Uh, it, it is, yes. Um, okay. It's a range of companies that provide specialist services, which are then collated together uh, in, in considering whether or not to make um, a claim. In this particular case, not only the level monitoring data, but all the other report aspects collated and considered do implicate the oak trees in causing subsidence to that property. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. If you could lower your hand for me, that would be great. 
Um, I have no other questions and no other hands up. So I'm going to move the recommendation, which is set out on the report. On, on, page... on page 22, Chairman, um, complemented you. by the supplementary on page one. Yeah, the informative on page one of the supplementary report. Um, and the recommendation is at 9.1. If I have a seconder, please. Chairman, I'm happy to second the recommendation. Thank you, Councilor Vice Chair. Councillor Brossard. Thank you. Uh, members, um, as we can see, the, the, the real preferable option here is the engineering solution, which although may be more expensive, is, is it, it, it does the job and it also saves these trees. Um, now, of course, this may be more expensive um, for the applicants or, or their insurers, uh, but something to bear in mind is, is that we saw from the officer's report that the trees were in situ before the houses were built. Um, and therefore, it necessarily follows that the trees would have been in situ before the applicant moved into the house. Um, and so, therefore, um, you know, it, they, are, they are part of the landscape of this, of this area. Um, does the seconder wish to speak? Uh, thank you, thank you, Chairman. Only to say that this has been an extremely comprehensive report. It covers the, these four oak trees in very great detail, and I feel that the presentation that Jan gave us and the answers that he gave really, I think, paint a picture of these quite magnificent trees. And it's for that reason that I am supporting the recommendation for the retention of the trees. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Vice Chair. Uh, does any member wish to speak? Councillor Barnard. Thank you very much, Chair. And can I thank uh, Jan Polnick for a very, very comprehensive report. This is uh, a, a very complex application, but in essence, it boils down to, we have four mature oak trees here. There are some issues arising from those, and those have been well explained during the report. Um, and it's very much of my view as the, uh, as the local councillor that we should be protecting, preserving these trees in this location and that alternative solutions should be sought to ensure that ongoing damage um, is minimised. I've looked into this very carefully. Um, it's not just the visual amenity, it's the biodiversity, it's the fact that these were planned into the estate environment alongside many other mature oak trees, and these have actually survived and are thriving. But sadly, that's not the case for all in this state location. It's not just one tree, it's a group of trees, and I think collectively they contribute significantly to the environment. And I have been contacted by a number of residents and localities saying that they really feel very strongly that these form a huge and important part of the environment and lion oaks and around that part of the estate and the development and that they wish to seek them retained. But they do appreciate and understand the complexity that that brings in terms of resolving other issues. But we have a tree preservation order, and I believe it's the responsibility and the right thing for this council to uphold them. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Barnard. Uh, Councillor Bandari. Thank you, Chair. Um, I think some of the comments have been made starting with the uh, Chair, what you mentioned that the trees were always there when the houses were built. So they sort of came with the package. So, so, so I guess, you know, that was always an understanding. Secondly, we have these four beautiful thriving and there is an option, you know, if there was not an option, maybe, you know, we could look at what could be done. There is an option and not that materially different, you know, in terms of the, the costs that are talked about. Yes, you know, there is some significance on the costs. But if we compare that to the impact and the loss, and, and, and there was also a figure put of quarter of a million potential loss, but, but overall, you know, the loss of biodiversity, the loss of these beautiful trees, the, 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 the loss of the ecosystem that we, that we have there, I is, is too much for us to forego um, uh, in the event that we have a solution. So, so you know, uh, for that reason, you know, I will be supporting the officer's recommendation. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bandari. Councillor Hayden. Sorry, Chair, I lost, I lost the button. Um, apart from supporting uh, my colleagues and the officers, I actually uh, feel a little bit aggrieved at this. Um, it seems to me the insurance company has got his underwriting wrong and has tried to pass on the consequences of that to the council. 
And I just object to that out of principle. Um, the householder, I'm sure, has insured his property properly. Um, and those trees are far too important to too many people uh, to consider putting them in jeopardy. So, again, I support my colleagues. Thank you, Councillor Hayden. Councillor Brown. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, uh, for my for my money, as it were, um, these trees were there from before the houses, so um, that's why the place is called Lion Oaks. Um, but a major practical factor is that actually, um, if the trees are removed, there could be further trouble with with uh, heave instead of subsidence. So. I think the very best solution all round is to put that barrier in um, and it would save um, routes going even further and possibly affecting uh, the next door house as well. I think uh, it would be the most practical solution to put that in. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Brown. Councillor Ballybo. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I think I'm, uh, I'll... Pretty much everybody has, has uh, covered a lot of the stuff uh, that I was uh, going to say. Uh, but I, I also would like to add, it is very difficult to, to put a price on four healthy oak trees. You know, I know the office uh, has, has kind of put a, tried to put a sum of a quarter of a million pounds, but I just think uh, th these things are priceless. It, it's taken years to get this far. Uh, and also there is actually a very good long-term solution to this. Uh, but I think like uh, Councillor Aiden said, I think the insurance company are just looking for an easy way out. Uh, I will be supporting the officer's recommendation uh, tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Um, I haven't got anybody else that's um, indicating that they wish to speak. Um, and as nobody has spoken against recommendation, um, I think we should just put it straight to the vote. Anna, or is it Lizzie? No, it is me, Chair. All right. Okay. Councillor Angel. For the, re for the recommendation. Councillor Dr Barnard. For. Councillor Bandari. For. Councillor Birch. For. Councillor Brossard. For. Councillor Brown. For. Councillor Dudley. Four. Councillor Badibo. Four. Councillor Green. Four. Councillor Mrs. Hayes. Four. Councillor Hayden. Four. Councillor Mrs. Mackenzie. Four. Councillor Mrs. Mackenzie Boyle. Four. Councillor Mossum. Four. Councillor Parker. Four. And Councillor Virgo. Four. That's all in favour, Chair. Thank you very much indeed. Therefore, the recommendation at page on page 22, 9.1, as amended, is carried. Uh, we move on then to agenda item six, which is White Gates, Mushroom Castle, Winkfield Row, um, which is a section 73 application. Uh, before we ask the officer to give her report, uh, can I just confirm, uh, Ms Madden, that you can still hear me? Yes, I can. And you can hear the officers reporting. Yes, indeed. Th thank you very much indeed. So I will now ask the officer to give a report and then Miss Madden, I will come to you for your comments. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Yes, as you said, this is an application, a Section 73 application to vary the approved plans for the development at White Gates Mushroom Castle, the proposed amendments are to relocate the dormer windows on the detached garage, formerly facing towards the east, and now, they're, now they have been installed in the west elevation, so it's a retrospective application. I'll just move on to the plans. So, just to zoom in, this is the garage in question and the rear boundary borders the rear gardens of properties on Merlin Clove. The dormer windows are shown here on the west elevation facing towards the west. 
um, they were approved to be on the east elevation facing towards the east. There's a separation distance from the center of the nearest window to the rear boundary of 12 meters, and then another 10 meters from the rear boundary to the rear elevations of the properties on Merlin Clove. I will just move to the next plan. This is the plan showing uh, the as built garage, and you can see the dormer windows. They're serving a first floor. And now I'll move on to the photos as the dormer windows have already been installed. Just to zoom in, this is the view of the garage from the Garden of Seven Merlin Clove, and you can see the dormer windows here. They were approved to have been on the east elevation. And now another photo close up from the boundary, just so you can see the proximity to the boundary. Here we have a view from the, pro the property, Seven Merlin Oaks, towards the dormer window, so you can see uh, the relationship there. And finally, this is a view from the street scene, Merlin Clove. The application site is in between these two properties, so this is to illustrate the impact of the relocation on the street scene. I'll return to the block plan to discuss the findings of the application. In terms of the impact on the character of the area, given the separation distance of the application site to public views, um, it is not considered that the relocated dormer windows have a significant or prominent impact on the street scene, and therefore the proposed development um, is not considered to be adversely impacting on the character of the area. In terms of impact on residential amenity, it is acknowledged that the windows can be seen, readily seen from the rear gardens and properties on Merlin Clove, and that there is a perception of overlooking. However, the center of the window to the rear boundary is 12 meters. The design guidance, Bracknell's design guidance recommends a 10 meter separation distance, and this is facing onto the rear garden. And then the separation distance from the center of the window to the rear properties on Merlin Clove is 22 meters. This accords with the design guidance, uh, Bracknell's design guidance of a rear facing window to a rear facing window face opposite. In addition to this, the windows are at an oblique angle to the properties on Merlin Clove, reducing the uh, visibility. Given the compliance with the separation guidelines set out in the design SPD and the oblique angle of the windows, it is not considered that the level of overlooking would be sufficiently severe to warrant a refusal. There are no considered um, highway safety implications or other considerations necessary for this application. As such, the application is recommended to be approved. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much indeed, Olivia. Okay, uh, Ms. Madden, uh, if you could now switch your camera and microphone on and I'll explain the rules as we have them. For, uh, for public speaking. Um, you are allowed three minutes uninterrupted public speaking. Um, we are very strict on, on that three minutes. Um, and, you, and during that time, you can state your case. Um, I will time the three minutes accurately. And just to give you uh, some forewarning, um, the only interruption you will hear is at two minutes and 40 seconds, where I will say 20 seconds. Um, and after that, I, I will expect you to stop speaking. Um, following that, I will ask members of the planning committee if they have any questions of clarification on what you've said. Um, and then following that, we will then go to the members meeting um, for members to ask questions and debate the planning application, as you heard previously on the tree planning application. Um, during that debate, I'm afraid you cannot take part in the meeting whatsoever. So is, is that clear, Ms. Madden? Yes, it is. Okay, so in the immortal words, your three minutes start now. 
I feel particularly strongly about this case as I bought my house before the building work started, after very careful scrutiny of the original plans that you had agreed and that residents had accepted, which included a sizeable garage with first floor windows which faced a park. I was therefore utterly dismayed to watch the builders fitting new windows which faced our properties without any prior notification to either the council or any neighbours adversely affected. The invasive loss of privacy explains why I, together with 100% of the neighbouring houses, have unanimously objected to this alteration, which feels as though it's been introduced by stealth. It is somewhat frustrating that an investigating planning officer has stated that the relationship with the adjoining properties is considered acceptable as nobody undertaking the assessment has been stood in my bedroom, my bathroom, garden, or indeed within the grounds of any of my neighbours' homes to understand how it feels to be on our side of the fence. We all feel it should be down to the owner or the developer to prove that the changes are needed and can therefore be justified. A better view is not a justifiable reason, in our opinion, to rip up the plans that were approved and which we all accepted. And indeed, as I remind you, the alternative original views for these windows is a park. There would be no directly affected neighbours and no objections as these plans were agreed and accepted by all residents as a fair part of the planning process. It feels unjust, therefore, that the burden of responsibility in this situation sits with the affected residents to have to challenge. If in that case we would question the point of planning permission, if somebody can put in retrospective permission and that can be allowed. In summary, all we would ask is for you, the people we trust, to represent us, to uphold the planning laws, and to fairly ask the owners or the developers to simply conform to the original plans which you agreed. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much indeed, Ms Madden. Two minutes and 40 seconds, well done. Do members have any questions for Ms Madden of, uh, of clarification or accuracy? Uh, Councillor Gore. Thank you, Chair. Uh, good evening, Ms. Madden. Mm -hmm. um, I'm. I wanted to ask you a, a point of clarity on your um, address just now. Um, you, you've stated, from what I remember, that uh, uh, there was no notification um, to you. Um, am I to understand that it was left to residents to call out the discrepancy? which ultimately prompted this retrospective application? Correct. I notified the council because we realised that the windows were being built on the wrong side of the garage and we notified the council, which is what prompted this. Thank you, Miss Madden. Thank you. Any other members have any questions for Miss Madden? I can't see any other questions, Ms. Madden, so thank you very much indeed. If you could now mute and turn your camera off, um, of course, you'll be more than welcome. I'm sure you will stay for the debate and the vote. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, members, do you have any questions for officers? Okay, I can't see any. Uh, oh, Colin. Councillor Brown. Sorry, Chair, I couldn't get my chat. That's, that's working. All right. I'm just, I'm <laughs> um, just a hand. <laughs> um, uh, can I see, please, um, the location of, of this garage again, please, the, where the park and the neighbours are? No problem. Please. So, um, unfortunately, there's not a plan that shows both the relationship of the garage to the neighbours in the park and the position of the garage, but I think you can see it's in the top right corner. 
of the application site. So if I zoom into this plan, oh, great. approximately here where my, my um, mouse, that, this is an approximate location. Yeah. So there's no dwellings um, to the east of that? No, there's no dwellings and no um, planning applications or approved dwellings either to the east or the west of the application site. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And Councillor Brossard. Yep. Th th thank you, Chairman. Olivia, a couple of questions that I've got. Um, it may have shown it, but it's in very small print. I presume it is actually a mezzanine floor, is it, that's incorporated within the garage, that there is a separation? Because I think there's also a staircase, isn't there, that I saw internally. That's right. So it's a, 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 a first floor. Um, the It's for ancillary use, so it can be used as a study area in association with the main house. Fine, thank you for that. The second question, Olivia, is that I see that in the photograph that you actually displayed of the two dormer windows, at the present time, there's no glazing in those windows. Has that been the subject of discussion with the applicant or has it just been left for them to install the, the glazing if and when this planning application is approved? As my assessment was that uh, restricted glazing would not be necessary, I didn't request this on the applicants. However, if the planning committee is minded to, a condition could be imposed requiring the windows to be obscure glazed and fixed shut or top opening. Thank you, Olivia. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Vice Chair. Um, Councillor Angel. Sorry, I beg your pardon, Councillor Angel. It's Councillor Buddy both first. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, thank you, Olivia. Uh, what normally happens when somebody doesn't build to the planning application that was approved? Well, um, our planning enforcement team would investigate and uh, they would make uh, either they would um, serve an enforcement notice or they would recommend that a planning application is submitted um, or they may take the view that the alterations are so minor that um, it's not in the public interest to um, continue with an investigation. We have non-material amendments come through, don't we? Yeah, so on, in, this, in this occasion when uh, it was brought to your notice that this was happened or this has happened, what was, uh, did you serve notice? Uh, did you recommend uh, uh, that an application be submitted, but what was actually said to the applicant from the council on this? Uh, well, th this this wasn't me. It was um, a planning enforcement officer that that, in, that investigated the, the site. So I don't know exactly what what the conversations were had between between them and the applicant. But but the upshot was that they submitted an application. Yeah, under normal circumstances, Councillor Badebo, what would happen is if planning enforcement said that this required. Um, alternative planning commission or amendment to a planning commission, the applicant would be invited to submit a, a planning application to what's called regularise um, the, the current um, construction, which is what's happened here. So this, this is quite normal. Does that answer your question, Mike? Yes, I, yeah. I'm just trying to determine. I know we uh, we always reminded not to uh, refer back to, or we should determine planning application solely on the planning application in front of us. But is it okay? Because we have to look back at the previous planning application. I think we have to reference. I'm trying to get the importance at the time of our approving the previous application to the location of this dormant window. And yeah, I'm so what, going what to ask the right is question. The, yeah, well, the previous application would have had dormant windows on the opposite slope of the garage. Um, as you can see from the photograph, they have been built not in accordance with the approved plans. And so therefore it requires planning application, uh, planning permission, um, 
to um, to approve these new approved plans, even though it's built. Um, we have to deal with it exactly the same as if it hadn't been built yet. Um, so uh, it's, it's just an, a normal procedure. No, I understand that, Chair. Like I said, I'm trying to... I don't know what question to ask because I, I'm, okay. thinking, I'm, I'm trying to gauge the importance. For example, I know this is our answer. Would, would the application, would it have been refused because the dormer window went, were on the other side as part of the entire application instead of just changing a little bit of change now? Because obviously it's not, you know, it, it sounds a little bit simpler once the house right. is built because it doesn't... previous... Change. The previous application with the dormer windows on the other side have been approved. Yes. Okay. So what, what's happened here is our enforcement officers have investigated a report of um, construction not in accordance with the approved plans, and the applicant has been invited to submit a planning permission application to regularise uh, the situation, which is what we're dealing with here. It's, it's, it's just a straightforward decision. So, so you know, what we have to do is we have to look at this application and we have to look at what is in situ, just the same as if it was being, being, being applied for if it hadn't been built and decide under planning policies whether or not we wish to uh, approve this application. It's, it's, it's just exactly the same. Okay, can I then... Lastly, just to ask, was this a, a mistake? No, that, that's not, doesn't matter. I don't okay. think it was a mistake, but it, it doesn't matter. We, we have to decide on this application as it is in front of us. The reasons and why fors and wherefores as to why it is how it is has got absolutely nothing to do with it. You, you can decide with your knowledge of our current playing policies, which the officer has explained, whether or not to approve the application as it stands at the moment. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, uh, Councillor Angel, it's the same question. Um, and Councillor Gore, did you have another question? I don't think I've asked a question at this uh, stage of the proceedings no, yet. No, I... you haven't, no, and you can ask as many as you want. Thank you, Chair. I want to ask two questions, if that's all right. Uh, Olivia, thank you for the presentation. Uh, the first question I want to ask you is, the resident uh, clearly said that uh, they instigated the process um, because of the discrepancy in the build. Can you actually confirm that enforcement officers did attend the site? I, I can't answer that. I, I believe they did, but I couldn't say a hundred percent that they they have done my memory is that i've had a conversation with the enforcement officer who advised that they've been on site but i i could be i don't want to say a hundred percent i'm sure that they have been on site thank you the second question olivia is to do with uh, the measurements that you that that you gave um can you confirm um how those were obtained because uh, again the resident says that no one's been uh, to their property and, you know, with the COVID situation, um, there hasn't been really free movement. So I'd be interested to know what, what, how they are, they've been quantified. So these measurements are based on the position of the approved garage. This application doesn't propose to change the position of the garage. So the measurements are on, as, a, on, as shown on these plans are exactly the same as were approved on site. So if we approve this permission, it would not be approving the relocation of the garage. If there is a question about um, if the garage is not built in accordance with the approved plans in terms of position, approving this application would not jeopardize an investigation into that. The only um, element we are considering is the position of the windows. So. So may I have one further question, Chair, just as a point of uh, clarification? No. Um, yes, yeah, so, so my point, uh, Olivia, is if if the build of the garage is not correct, um, the, 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 the statement about um, the relationship with the adjoining properties being acceptable may not be correct either. So 
uh, one relates to the other and so that's why I'm trying to establish um, if we if we can 100% rely on those measurements. Absolutely. If we approve, if, if the council is minded to approve this application and it turns out a visit on site determines that garage has been built in a position not in accordance with the approved plans, this permission, they would be in breach of this permission also. Um, and then it would be up to the planning enforcement team to uh, recommend uh, either putting in another Section 73 application or potentially taking enforcement action. Thank you, Olivia. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Gore. Okay, I can't see any other questions. Um, I, I've got a further question. If you can just leave that, um, that up there. I, I wonder if you could once again enlarge that section you enlarged before, please. Thank you. So on this, on this view, um, those two red lines with the arrows, that is donating the boundary and the position of the rear windows of the affected properties. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. And could you indicate on there, because it's not shown, around about where the garage is? The approximate location of the garage is here in the top left, uh, top right corner. Okay. So the approved plans with the windows facing in the other direction. Mm -hmm. um, would have had windows that affected that other property to the top to the top right. Is that correct? That's correct. The relationship would have been similar to this that further property as it is to these these ones on Merlin Close now. Yes. Okay, fine. Thank you. Any other questions, members? I can't see any other, so therefore uh, it falls to me to move the officer's recommendation. On page 43, Chairman, without any supplementary information. Page Thank 43. You. Page 43 at 11. Okay, if I have a seconder, please. I'm happy to second the recommendation, Chairman, uh, provided I also have the opportunity of seeking permission for um, an additional condition or an amendment to the application. Okay, well, if you'd like to, as you've seconded it, if you'd like to move your amendment now, um, it saves us debating this and then debating um, mm. a, a further, a further uh, uh, motion. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Um, uh, the proposal basically is that we should install, in the interest of privacy for the, uh, the, the neighbours, I believe that it would be appropriate for us to condition this application, this retrospective application, for uh, gl obscure glazing to be installed, minimum of Pilkington level three, and also for the, if there was to be an opening window at the top, that that should be a minimum of 1.7 metres from the level of the flooring in the mezzanine in order that that would provide privacy for the adjacent neighbours. Thank you, Chairman. Okay. I'll ask the officers uh, advice on whether or not that would be a reasonable amendment, please. Um, thank you, Chairman. In my view is that it would be an unreasonable amendment given the separation distances meet our design guidelines um, in terms of non-restricted windows and that the windows are in fact at 90 degrees from the neighbouring gardens. So it reduces the view even further. Um, so okay. my view is that it would be unreasonable to impose that condition. Okay, um, in, in which case I, I can't accept that amendment. However, if, if Councillor Brossard, if you have a seconder for your amendment, um, then we can debate it. Is there a seconder for Councillor Brossard's amendment? I will second that, actually, um, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Virgo. Um, in which case, um, we'll just go through, I believe what we have to do is, is vote on the amended uh, application. Um, to see if um, if that becomes a substantive motion. I'm just trying to remember my, my rules now. Do I have to go to a vote on the amendment now? It's the amendment now. It's the amendment right. only at this point. 
Okay, what, well, a vote for it, Councillor Birch? Uh, it is my understanding we have to do a vote on the, whether the amendment is acceptable, and then okay. if it falls, the... We uh, go back to the substantive uh, motion. Correct. Yeah, thank um, you for that correct. advice. Okay, um, so let's go straight to a vote to see if members accept the amendment. Um, so Hannah, if you can go through that, please. Yeah, certainly. Councillor Angel. Against. Councillor Dr Barnard. For. Councillor Bandari. For. Councillor Birch. Against. Councillor Brossard. For the amendment. And Councillor Brown. Against. Councillor Dudley. Against. Councillor Badibu. For. Councillor Green. For. Councillor Mrs Hayes. Against. Councillor Hayden. Against. Councillor Mrs Mackenzie. Against. Councillor Mrs Mackenzie Boyle. For. Councillor Mossum. Against. Councillor Parker. For. And Councillor Virgo. Oh. That is tied, Chair. Oh, grief. <laughs> Eight votes each. Chairman's <laughs> vote. Yeah, well, I'm afraid the motion falls. Uh, so now we debate the substantive motion. Uh, would anybody wish to speak? Uh, Councillor Bandari. Thank you, Chair. Um, so, you know, it was interesting. And of course, I think the, the, the vote has shown sort of uh, split thoughts on that. But first of all, hearing Ms. Madden, I think it overall feels wrong that, you know, we've, we've given a planning approval, something totally different has been built. We have no idea of that and it falls to the residents to bring it to our notice and then even then they have to fight for it. So, so, so that is just an emotional response, first of all. Coming to a more empirical or, or, or data-based response, I've just gone back and looked at the material considerations for, for deciding any planning application. And there are quite a few there, which, which again sort of you know, uh, uh, make me think that we should not be approving applications like these where where in spite of having a proper process in place, we, we sort of give a free reign where, where you know, people make changes in spite of having applications without any notice to us. And then we still go ahead and approve that. I don't think that helps us set the right president uh, overall, plus also in terms of the trust our residents place in us. So that is why if it was the amended application, I think that would have um, uh, managed some of those concerns. And, you know, I would have, supported that, but as it stands just now, unfortunately, I'll not be able to support the uh, recommendation. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bandari. Um, <clears throat> Councillor Birch. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I voted against the amendment uh, uh, because uh, the uh, putting obscure glazing, the advice we'd been given was that it was not reasonable to do that. And had we gone ahead and done it, uh, should the applicant have gone to appeal <laughs> uh, to get ordinary glass put in, uh, it, they were highly likely to have been successful. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the main point that I'm uh, uh, making here is that I am against the recommendation to approve in, on the basis that partly of what we've already heard, but if we view the uh, 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 considerations that were made at the last time this came before us uh, uh, and ask ourselves, would we have uh, uh, viewed it differently if we'd been advised that uh, these windows faced, and uh, I have had uh, development near me and uh, that has had windows uh, put in, and uh, although at an oblique angle, 
people still go up to the window, stand there and look out and have the full vista available to them, even though the window in question isn't facing fully on. So overlooking would have been, in my view, a consideration and I think is still a material consideration in this case, uh, along with the fact that having been uh, somebody tried to say, was it a mistake? Well, that's not a consideration for us to work out. But we, this committee gave the council, sorry, gave a, a, uh, a permission. That permission has not been uh, 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 built to the standard that it was. Um, it was the diligence of a neighbour that had to uh, bring us, uh, bring it to uh, our attention, not the fact that a developer had discovered some change in the uh, uh, circumstances there. So uh, I think there is sufficient material basis to say no to the windows being where they are and to seek their uh, uh, placement where the existing planning permission gives. So I will not be supporting the recommendation at 11. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Birch. Councillor Gore. Thank you, Chairman. Um, my view is um, that there's um, quite a few retrospective applications coming through, sometimes unavoidable, and other times there's a potential for circumnavigating the planning system. It's not fair to residents who rely on the integrity of the planning permission approval system, as, as we see in this case. I've got genuine concerns about the confirmed measurements uh, in this case, uh, as well as uh, I would agree with uh, Councillor Birch's points. And therefore, uh, in terms of the measurements, we can't say confidently and in planning terms, the relationship with the adjoining properties is acceptable. So I would therefore urge my uh, fellow members to support the residents in opposing this retrospective application. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Gore. Councillor Virgo. Uh, Mr Chairman, thank you very much. Sorry, thank you, Mr Cameron. Um, well, you've heard from Victoria Madden that she bought the house knowing that the dormer window would be on the east side overlooking the park and causing no privacy issues with the houses in Merlin Clove, which are positioned directly facing that development. She would not have purchased the property knowing that the dormer windows were on the east side directly in view of sight from her bedroom and the bathroom. Those, those pictures that we saw that Olivia was kind enough to show us clearly show that. Clearly this has made a, a huge difference to the overall bulk uh, of the building and is unfriendly and unsightly from the residents in Merlin Clove. Um, Councillor Birch has, has summed uh, uh, this up rather well. And I would say that um, if you look at the report, Olivia's report, um, there were 10 other um, complaints about it, including one from Winkfield Parish Council. So the variation of the original plans was brought to the attention of the planning department, as we've all said, and not, uh, and not by the developer. And I hope everyone agrees that if we pass these plans, we pass them and expect the developer to achieve the plans and not deviate because they think as they're constructing the, uh, the, the building, that it would be nicer to put windows this side. So I hope members will, will, will not support this application. Um, and I would say, Chairman, I have uh, a blue sheet um, in front uh, for members to consider uh, should this motion fall. Thank so you give notice an, alter an alternative motion should this fall? I do, sir. Thank you, Councillor Virgo. Uh, I've got Councillor Hayden, then Councillor Ballybo. So Councillor Hayden. Thank you, Chair. Um, I won't repeat uh, what Councillor Virgo and Councillor Birch said. I actually uh, share their views completely. What really confounds me on this is that there's no real reason why he should suddenly change his mind. It's almost as though he's done something on a whim, uh, but it's materially affected the neighbours. 
I just think, you know, from a point of view of principle, that is very unsound. So I oppose it as well. Thank you, Councillor Hayton. Councillor Ballybank. Oh, thank you, Chairman. I'm going to be voting against the officer's recommendation because I, I, I think we we send the wrong message. And I think a lot of my colleagues have actually... Can you put your video on, please, Michael? Oh, sorry. That's fine. Thank you. Thank you. I think we send the wrong message uh, if we approve this application. Uh, I was trying to determine whether this was a mistake or error, uh, because it does happen. Uh, but I don't feel it is. Uh, and I think if the applicant actually wanted the windows on that side, it, will have, it was easy just to come back to plan and even before the building work started uh, to try at least uh, get a planning permission uh, to, to make that change. Uh, I'm fearful uh, about the response from the officer that if, for example, uh, they made another change or something like that against the application, the enforcement officer could just say, look, put another planning application in uh, to try and, you know, afterwards. Uh, so I think we, we have to not so much send a message, but I think we it's important that we our residents, once a planning application is put in and is approved or declined, they go through an emotional uh, time and they go through a, a period of acceptance. Uh, and then uh, for someone to just do, an applicant to just carry out whatever they want, regardless of what the plan says, knowing full well that, oh, they could just come back afterwards and say, well, I built it anyway, I'm just gonna uh, apply. Uh, we, we have to try and discourage that. That is why I'll be voting against the recommendation. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Badiba. Does any other member wish to speak? Okay. Councillor Virgo has his hand up, I see. I don't know if Councillor... No, he, uh, he spoke Virgo. earlier. He spoke earlier. He gave... No, I haven't taken it down. Yeah. I don't know. No, it's okay. Um, a second of the of the original motion, Councillor Brossard, did you wish to speak or do you just want me to sum up? Uh, reserve, just to sum up, Chairman. Thank you. OK, thank you very much. OK, members, um, thank you very much indeed. That was a very interesting debate. Um, let's face it, planning is emotive. Uh, that is a fact. Uh, unfortunately, policies, policies on planning are not. Um, an amended application or a retrospective application has to be uh, decided and dealt with exactly the same as a normal application before a spade is put in the ground. Um, the fact that we heard from the officers that these windows, um, although to the neighbours may, may seem very close, um, the design gardens for face-to-face -face windows um, is um, less than the uh, distance that is being affected here. Um, there are concerns about measurements um, uh, and Councillor Gore made concerns about the measurements not being accurate. The fact of the matter is, if this application were to be approved um, and it was subsequently found that the measurements were inaccurate, um, then the, you know, that will be exactly the same as, as we're dealing with here insofar that an application would have to come forward once again um, to regularise the building not being in, uh, in accordance with approved plans. Um, and the, the fact that um, concerns about these measurements are in the minds of members, it's, it's really not a, cons a material consideration. What we're deciding on is the plans that are put in front of us. Um, the, the, other, the other thing to bear in mind, of course, that although the design guidance for face-to-face -face windows, um, the, the, the spacing is the excess of this, these are not face-to-face. -face. However, um, you as members uh, will decide on this application as you see fit. As always, this is a member-led planning decision and we will go to the vote, please. Thank you. Councillor Angel. Residents against the recommendation. Councillor Dr Barnard. Against. Councillor Bandari. Against. Councillor Birch. 
Against. Councillor Brossard. Against. Councillor Brown. Against. Councillor Dudley. For. Councillor Badibo. Against. Councillor Green. Against. Councillor Mrs Hayes. Against. Councillor Hayden. Against. Councillor Mrs Mackenzie. Against. Councillor Mrs Mackenzie Boyle. Against. Councillor Mossum. Against. Councillor Parker. Against. And Councillor Virgo. Against. That's 15 against and one in favour, Chair. Thank you very much indeed. In that case, the motion falls. And Councillor Virgo, you gave notice of a alternative motion. Would you like to move that motion now, please? Uh, yes. Can all members, thank you. Can all members see that? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Councillor okay, Virgo. Yes, I'm happy. Councillor Dale Birch, I'm happy to second. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Virgo, do you want to speak to your motion or do you want to put it to the vote? I'd just like to say briefly, I'm grateful to the members who've, um, who've uh, said against this because, um, uh, as members have said, if we don't stand up to the planning regulations, uh, it just gives a signal for any developer to do what they want as they go along. So uh, that would be my summing up, and I'm very pleased with the outcome. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Thank you. Does a second to wish to speak? Uh, no, thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Any other member wish to speak? Okay, then we'll put it to the vote. If you agree with the alternative motion, you are voting for. Thank you, Councillor Angel. For. Councillor Dr. Barnard. For. Councillor Bandari. For. Councillor Birch. For. Councillor Brossard. For. Councillor Brown. For. Councillor Dudley. Abstain. Councillor Badibu. Four. Councillor Green. Four. Councillor Mrs Hayes. Four. Councillor Hayden. Councillor Hayden. Four. Councillor Mrs Mackenzie. Four. Councillor Mrs Mackenzie Boyle. Four. Councillor Mossum. Four. Councillor Parker. Four. And Councillor Virgo. Four. That's 15 for one abstention, Chair. The motion is carried. Thank you, members. You can take that uh, take that down now, please. Thank you, uh, Ms. Madden. Your uh, the planning commission has been refused, and uh, if you wish to stay for the rest of the meeting, you're more than welcome. I'll leave, but thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. We move on to agenda item seven which is former St. Margaret Clivero Roman Catholic Church, Ringmead. That is, who's, who's doing that one? It's Simon, me. sorry, Simon. Me, Chair. That's all right. Thank you. No problem. Just share my presentation. Good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, this designated settlement site, as outlined in red on this plan. Um, oh, sorry, am I showing the screen? Just checking. No. No, we're just seeing your lovely face at the moment. Oh, well, that's not bad. <laughs> That'll get plenty of motion every day. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Can you see the screen? Yeah. Yeah, brilliant. Okay. I'll start again. Uh, thank you, Chair. This designated settlement site, as outlined on red, in red, has an approximate area of 0.67 hectares. The site was once the location of the St. Margaret Clitheroe Roman Catholic Church. However, the church building was vacated and demolished with the existing hard standing now overgrown in parts. The site is located between Ringmead, Hanworth Road and South Hill Road and is surrounded by woodland on all sides apart from the existing vehicular access onto Ringmead, which is here. East of and adjoining the site is the, is the Church of Jesus Christ Latter-day Saints, which is currently operating from the site. To the north is an area of plantation woodland that Bracknell Town Council has an interest in. This is this area here, outside the site. Glimpses of the development can be viewed from all three roads through the surrounding woodland within the winter months, although this is lessened somewhat within the summer months. 
trees to the front of the site on each side of the existing access, so here and here, are protected under TPO 638. There is currently pedestrian access out of the site along Ringmead and Hanworth Road, linking this site with areas such as Hanworth, Birch Hill and East Hampstead. These predominantly residential areas provide facilities such as schools, shops and medical facilities accessible by both foot and cycle. Given this, this site is considered sustainable location. This is the layout plan. The applicant seeks full planning permission for the erection of five storey apartment block together with associated basement and surface car parking, access roads, footpaths and associated landscaping. The building would contain six one bed and nine two bed apartments. The application has benefited from submission of amended plans seeking to address early concerns. The building consists of a core that is five storeys high on each side by two, three, side, sorry, on each side by two three-storey wings, with each apartment provided with external balcony space. The front of the building facing south is where the pedestrian access will be located, although there is also pedestrian and vehicular access provided to the rear of the building down to the basement. The building's design incorporates a step down in height from the five-storey core out to the three-storey wings. The applicant has set out in their submission a palette of external materials that will include buff brickwork, uh, vertical timber cladding, white render, and dark gray powder coated aluminium grills with associated frame surrounds. 14 surface parking spaces, of which two would be for disabled parking, would be provided along the main access road into the site. There would also be an enclosed cycle store and external visitor cycle spaces of this, off this main road. The main access road runs north and round to the rear of the building so that it connects to a ramped vehicular access to the basement and a further 13 parking spaces, again including two disabled spaces. There would also be cycle and motorcycle storage along with, along with access to the upper residential floors via a lift within the basement. Proposed to the rear of the building in this area here is a bin store that is accessible from the main access road where a refuse lorry can enter the site, access the bins and be able to turn and, and exit the site in a forward gear. The building and associated hard standing will be surrounded by a transitional area of amenity space between the built form and the site surrounding woodland. This is this area here. The site will have a footpath from Ringmead into the site, providing pedestrian access to both the front and rear of the building and to, and to an area uh, of terrace patio to the west of the building, which is here. I'm just going to show you some floor plans. So this is the basement. So you've got the parking within the basement. You've got some motorcycle storage, you've got cycle parking, you've got the two uh, disabled parking spaces I was talking about, and also the lift core up to the residential floors. And then you've got the ground floor, which is the, is the communal entrance here. And then you've got a, a rear en entrance and exit at the back past the bin store area. This is the first floor, the second floor, third floor, fourth floor, and just the roof plan. Uh, just, these are the elevations. So this is the front elevation, and here is the glazed entrance um, into the site. This is the side elevation that you'd be able to see from the side access road into the site. This is the rear elevation where you can see that there's the basement parking uh, access there where the ramp goes down. And this is the other side elevation to the building. Uh, these are some artist's impressions of what it might look like. I uh, just thought it'd give you a flavor of what, what the site could look like. Um, this is obviously the front elevation, the side with the, pa the um, patio terrace. Again, the side road with the access, sorry, side view with the access road, the rear elevation, and this is one that's been put together to show what it may look like um, from the entrance of Ringmead into the site, just to give you an idea of what, what the trees sort of do on site in terms of um, softening the appearance, although this is an artist's impression. So we'll just let you know that that might not be quite a true reflection of what happens on the site. 
Members are directed to the supplementary report for updates relating to this application, which include two additional objections and one letter of support that has been received. An additional condition, condition 29, and an additional section 106 heads of term. I'm now going to show some photos. So the first photo, these were taken within the sort of winter months, um, is the view of the existing access onto Rigmead. This is a view north from the existing access, and you can see the northern boundary. A view east from the former church car park towards the adjoining church. A view from the car park looking towards the existing access. A view south towards Claverdon in the distance. A view from the top of the site looking northeast. A view of the northern boundary. Again, another view of the northern boundaries with a pan around. A view northwest towards Hanworth roundabout. You can just see the cars through there. And again, I'm panning around, so this is a view further west. And then a view west towards Hanworth Road. Oh, and one final view of the middle of the site looking south towards Ringmead again. And I just thought I'd end this bit on with a with an aerial photograph I've put together which shows um, the site, approximate site, outlined in red of the, sorry, the, the application site, just to give you an idea from, from sort of bird eye, bird's eye view of what the, the vegetation looks like on the site. This is the plantation, this is the church next door, and then you've obviously got a lot of the vegetation within the site here. Okay, as stated in my report, the proposal is considered acceptable in terms of its design, appearance, siting, and scale, and there are considered to be no adverse impacts on the character and appearance of the area. The proposal would not result in any detrimental impacts upon amenities of existing and or future occupiers due to the layout and significant distance from any neighbouring amenity. I'll just say that at the moment, the closest point to the building would be um, number one Claverdon, which would be 60 metres away. That's the closest point. <laughs> the development provides on-site amenity space along with accept an accepted drainage strategy. The proposal is considered acceptable by the local highways authority in terms of off-street parking and safe access to and from Ringmead. The scheme, subject to conditions, would provide adequate biodiversity mitigation and enhancement. The proposal, subject to an obligation in the legal agreement, would provide on-site 25% affordable housing, equating to four units within a sustainable location. In conclusion, it is considered that the full, app, the full application would deliver a well-designed residential scheme for 15 units on a previously developed site within the settlement. In light of the above, it is recommended that it is delegated to the head of planning to approve the application subject to conditions and the completion of a section 106 agreement to secure what is set out in both the committee report and the supplementary report. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Uh, members, if you could let me know if you've got any questions. I've got a couple to start with. Um, first off, I heard you say that this application uh, complies with affordable housing and there will be four affordable housing units included in this uh, construction. Is that right? That's correct. Yeah, well, it, it works out at something like 3.75, but I've never said yeah. 0.75 of a, <laughs> of a unit. So I believe we'll be asking for four units to make that 25%. Thank you. Um, I also note in the, um, in the uh, conditions, condition three, prior to commencements, commencements of soup, sam samples of external materials to be used that face yeah. the development should be submitted. Um, I'm quite interested in, in what the kind of materials are going to be used on the exterior. Um, you know, I'm going to say, is it cladding? Um, and if yes. so, are we going to be careful that um, it's, it's cladding that meets with our building safety requirements? Um, I believe so. I mean, the reason why I've put that condition is, is primarily just really for the, the purpose of how it will look. Um, I'm hoping that my colleagues in building control will be have have things in place to can to, to look at the aspect of, of cladding i know i know it's a hot topic it's it's not a you know the news was, was, was awful what happened um but i'll just um but if we you know if i can at the moment that is purely for design as in and as in aesthetics 
Um, I would normally rely on building regulations to, to cover that aspect. Um, I don't know if there's anything else you want to answer on that. Well, if, if you could, if it's building regulations, perhaps you could yeah. ask them to um, just let me know, please. I will do. The only problem is, is it could come in as an, uh, through an independent inspector um, for building yeah. And so therefore, well, but um, I'll do my best. I'll do my best. And I, all I could do Thank is you. I could have a, com sorry, I could have a conversation with building regs. Um, if the application is approved and, and someone is writing it to, to discharge that condition, I'll have a word. Yeah, it, it does look like render on most of it, actually. But um, also, Yeah, yeah, I, 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 I get what you're saying. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thank you. Um, OK, questions. I've got, uh, is it Councillor Badibo first? Yes. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Simon. Can you see me? Can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you. Yeah, I can see you. Yeah, okay. yeah we can yes, see you. I, it's, uh, it's, uh, I don't know whether it's a question or something. There are no e entry or exit to South Hill Road. I think we're missing a trick here. I think if, we, if you can, in terms of even just a bicycle path to South Hill Road, the reason why I say that is because there's a bus stop in South Hill, on South Hill Road, uh, that uh, if you, or else, I'm sure naturally people will make that path. Because yeah, the problem is, is, Michael, that we have to decide on the application that's before, before it. Yeah. Um, and parts of any bicycle path or footpath might be outside of the ownership of the applicant. As you can see, yeah. the red line doesn't go all the way up to South Hill Road. No, I, 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 there has... I respond, Chair. Yeah, Simon, yeah, go, go for it, Andy. Um, the in the early stages of this application, the applicant did consider the implementation of a path through South Hill Road, um, but that encountered a significant objection in terms of the impact on trees. You can see there's a large number of trees around the boundary of the site, particularly to the north, and the trees to the north of the site are outside of the application boundary and are within an area I believe to be in the ownership of Brentland Forest Council itself. Um, so the implementation of that um, path that was originally envisaged proved extremely difficult and so it has been removed from the application that is before you. Uh, that is correct, uh, that Andy's just said, and, and, and just, just to also add to that, there was also a biodiversity, I think, objection as well, that, that it was going to also almost cause more problems than it would sort of in terms of its benefits, so, um, but uh, that isn't now part of this application. Okay. Uh, Any okay. other questions, Michael? Yes, I, I, I do. If that is not possible to, to join South, I mean, on the, uh, just, is the ring, where's that ring made on the corner? Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. What's that? Sorry. Sorry. By the roundabout. Yeah. Yeah. Just, as you come out of this this road, uh, the ring main road, on that corner, the pavement starts. Yeah. Just there. Just yeah. where, for example, the pavement starts there. So uh, there's nothing wrong in putting a cycle path to that pavement so that people can at least go around the roundabout to get to South Hill Road. I'm just thinking there's no other way of getting to that road, right? Because there's no pavement between that corner and the entrance to the uh, to the uh, development because it's grassed. And it's a footpath on the other side of the road, isn't it? Yeah. I understand that, but you have to cross the road and then that's... Yeah. yeah. I understand what you're saying, Councillor Badibo, but what yeah. we have to do is we have to decide on the application that's in front of us and, and not do a, additional um, access and egress on, on the hoof. We, we've got to decide on this application as it is before us. I, I totally understand. I'm just thinking of, you know... To climate change and anything environmental and things like yeah. that, it's always good what, to consider these things with any other. What does that say at the bottom planet? there, Michael? Sorry, uh, Simon. What, sorry, um, Simon. What does that say? It, at the it says there? crossing crossing point with drop curbs and tactile paving on both sides of Ringby. So that's what they've proposed. So I mean, it's I see I see what the council is saying. Um, you know, and I of maybe something up here would be would be would be nice. But I mean, at the end of the day, they've. This is a scheme that's considered acceptable by the highway authority and myself because it provides 
a crossing point, uh, safe crossing point for, for the residents uh, into an area where there is residential uh, houses and, and also the provisions that I've mentioned earlier. So, yeah. That's if I may point. also add, Chair and Councillor Baribo, that the area you're discussing is outside of the red line and is in fact adopted highway. And um, should such a link be warranted and obviously acceptable in terms of impact on trees and biodiversity, you can see there are some that overlap that area, um, that could potentially be funded through SIL payments made by this development in any case. Thank you very much, officers. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor. Um, OK, uh, let me just got, uh, I've got uh, Councillor Brown next, and then I've got Councillors Virgo, Hayden and Hayes. Councillor Brown. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Um, can I ask um, the to confirmation that this is um, a hilly, hilly piece of ground? In fact, that's that's quite... That's that section of that area of ground is is higher place than um, anywhere around it, except perhaps the roundabout. Just trying to give you an idea of. I mean, that just suggests that, yes, you, you're correct, Councillor. There, there's yeah, it's, it's, uh, so, I'm quite familiar with the site um, yeah. and um, to the to the south, we've got Clarendon, which is houses. Yes. And to the north, just across the road, we've got houses and um, three-storey flats, which are the uh, sort of kingpins of ba Babbage Way. Yes. What's your What's your question, Councillor Brown? Um, and I, there, there aren't any other buildings that tall around there, are there? There aren't. No. Um, I mean, this this site. I I'm of the opinion that this site doesn't really relate to any one of these areas like Hanworth, Ringmead, um, uh, East Hampton, Ringmead, and, and, and oh, I can't remember the other one, sorry, <laughs> off the top of my head, but the, the surrounding residential areas, it's a sort of, sort of self-enclosed um, uh, site on its own that this development would provide its own character. Um, and also you've got the, the church next door, um, which is of a uh, you could almost say it's a contemporary design now, but obviously it's been around for, for a while. So I, I think in a way it's, a, it's a, an opportunity to have something new and something contemporary on this site. Um, and it is on the roundabout. And I think, to be honest, this site probably relates more to the road network than it does to, to the residential areas that surround. Well, can I ask how tall is the church then next to it? Is that sort of between two and three stories? Oh, sorry, I, I, I couldn't say it's that not, would have been useful to have that question before council sorry i i think that it is let me I don't, see yeah that. i think it's something like that i'm not going to disagree <laughs> thanks all right thank you councillor virgo um thanks mr chairman a couple of couple of uh, questions simon um, first question is you showed us a really nice picture illustrated picture from our wonderful designers of lots of <laughs> to soften um, to soften the building. Yeah. Have you got any kind of condition that those trees will be put in, or was it just to convince us it would look nice? Uh, well, if you see this plan at the moment, well, this isn't the landscape plan. I mean, a lot of these trees here are the trees that are already existing on the site and they're going to be retained. So there's only going to be a few added trees within the site here, here, I think here, yep. and we're already there. So I, I did try and caveat that, that that was an illustrative sort of artist's impression but it but i do feel that this site is is already sufficiently screened from from the site from outside i'm not going to say you won't be able to see it especially within the winter months but it is already softened by quite a substantial um belt of trees especially to the north where you've got the plantation trees and then you've also got this gap or belt of amenity space so uh, yeah, I hope that answers your question. <laughs> well, it does. The only thing I would ask is, on the trees that we see heavily in green, yeah. uh, have we got any condition that they have to be retained, or are we hoping that they will retain them? There will be uh, there will be a landscape plan, but I mean, the, 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 I've never been told or asked to put a TPO on the site. The, the trees mm. at the moment, and I don't know why, but the trees that protected the site are around here and here. They weren't, these aren't protected. Um, 
The only thing I, 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 I'd make this point is t- this is quite a big development and to get all this equipment in worries me that they're going to take trees away. Oh, I don't believe that the access is already very substantial. Um, I've already had a conversation with the tree officer. He was consulted on this. And, and as, as you'll see, there's, there's, a, there's numerous tree conditions which talk about mm. phase and various phases for them to look at. So I've, it's never come up as a concern from them. Um, I think the actual access already is quite substantial and I don't think it would be uh, a problem, to be honest. OK, um, second question, um, page 59. Um, and this was on sustainable and energy, Simon. Oh, yes. You made the point, actually, in 958, um, where you said no specific details have been submitted. This could be overcome by a condition. Um, what worries me about all these things, particularly with climate change, is that can we enforce all this? Can we make sure that the developer does live up to what or what he's sort of a, in terms of sustain, sustainability, energy requirements, and so on. Yes, I mean, I'm just trying to look up at the moment. I mean, there are conditions that actually cover um, renewable energy and um, carbon emission, uh, sorry, um, the fabric of the building being uh, built to a, an appropriate standard, which is which actually has a reduction in carbon um, emissions. And also, um, yes, the- so I use your, your line when you say, Whilst no specific details have been submitted, yes, but we've con- well, I've put a condition in place to make sure those details are, details are submitted, and that they have with the policy. I think it's CS10 and CS12 of the core strategy. So therefore, this development wouldn't would not be. They're basically they're, they're pre commencement conditions. They can't commence the development until the details have been submitted, and we are happy with them. And then they have to be built in accordance with those details. Okay, it's, it's conditions 20, 27 and 28 on page 68 of your agenda. Thank you, Thank Chair. You Thank you, Chair. Okay. Um, and in addition to that, um, with regards to your uh, tree um, questions, there is a condition on here that I found and I've now lost. Um, uh, I think it's, sorry, has anybody found it? I did find the tree condition. I think it's condition 16. 16, yes. Yeah. 16. Yeah. And, and then it yeah. goes on. There's, there's yeah. numerous conditions after that. Yeah, condition 16. Um, yeah. And also yeah. condition 22. Yes. Okay, thank you for that, Chair. All right, no problem. Thanks, Councillor. Councillor Hayden. Thank you, Chair. Um, just a quick question. I couldn't see it anywhere in the papers. This used to be the site of a faith-based organisation. Are there any covenants on the site in terms of its use that might have an impact on the planning application? Um, I'm not aware of any, but I do believe that's that's not planning consideration anyway. But I, I, I'm not aware of any. It's not something I would need to look up as such. I mean, if they can't implement this consent because there's a covenant, then that's that's outside of the planning process. Mm. Simon, Thank Michael Brosson, I, I wonder if it's Simon. actually covered in the, in the supplementary on page one. There is a reference, I think, to the churches there are on the supplementary. Let's just have a look. Is that about, but that's, I think that was to do with some comments that have come, come in um, after my report was finalised. Um, and that was to do with the um, loss of a community benefit or, 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 or having site open for a community benefit what i said is it's a it was basically the, the choice of the roman catholic church to, to to leave the site and demolish the building um the site is now a brownfield site for development um so it wasn't yeah, it wasn't quite like that but <laughs> and if there are any covenants it's yeah thank you mike if there are any covenants it's outside of planning considerations anyway it would be a it would be a civil matter um, if they couldn't um, achieve the building because of other issues. That's nothing to do with us giving plenty of permission for it. Uh, Councillor Hayes. Thank you, sir. Um, actually, I think most of my questions have been answered. It was page 57, 9.35, 9.38, but I think 16, 22 might cover it. But just for clarification there, Simon, 
Yes. Uh, where the red boundary is, the other side uh, you stated was land owned by the borough. Uh, yeah, I, I believe it's either owned by the borough and leased to Bracknell Town Council or Bracknell Town Council. I'm not, I'm not too sure, but Bracknell Town Council have, a, have, have, um, have an interest in this land, but it's outside of this site. Anyway. My concern there being that we keep that as it is woodland, is it not? It's like it's down as a plantation, yeah, but it's woodland, yes. It should be protected then, shouldn't it, for future it's, retained as? Yeah, if, it, if that woodland to the north is under our own ownership, um, which I'm sure, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't know, um, it would then be protected anyway. They'd have, you know, I don't think that's why we don't put TPOs, I don't think, on our. Then I'd ask the chairman that that would be part, that that would, it should this be allowed. Well, it's outside of the it's outside of the application area, Councillor Hayes. But if it's in public ownership, we can certainly look at that and see whose yes, ownership please. it's under. Yeah. Yes, please, because I, I will admit I was trying to get in on the last application. I, I worked out the hand part now. I couldn't get the chat bit to work. <laughs> Having said that, I now want you to look at this one thing you do know I would ask about first is the place where the bins are. Yes, I thought that. That's the one thing I, I tried to cover for you there, Councillor. Yeah, we, we said on Monday in my briefing, <laughs> Councillor Hayes, that, that you would ask this question, so we're ready. It's OK for you to state that it is easy to get in and out. Do you think that is a sufficient size for the building that you are acquiring there? Because now that food waste, and I know my councillors to support me on this, will be looking at flats and HMOs and all the rest over the coming months because we want to supply such. When the officers gave their views that they had no problems, do you think this is sufficient, this area at the back? Because I have visited flat areas recently and they do not and cannot accommodate properly. This Can, you, can you enlarge that, please? Yeah, sorry. Simon, just... Um, I did consult with... Yes, there was this application. Of, uh, circumstances with regards to our collections now. Um, well, I've consulted on this application, and, and basically they they had no objection to the scheme and thought it in there. So I would. Yeah, that's what I can say. Really, it looks. It looks. Sorry, I will take it up in my office. I do think that it's insufficient there for the size. Yeah. Can, can I ask Councillor Hayes, you know, you're quite right to raise these issues, but um, as should. well with your your officers to raise these issues at the time yeah, well, of consultation. Yeah. yeah, thank you. I have one last question. Yeah. Yes. Um, the amount of flats and the uh, bedrooms and such that you were showing, is it all underground parking? No, no surface there's surface parking as well. No, there's 14 surface parking spaces. And then there's 13 in the basement. And then of all, of all of that, there are four disabled spaces, two up, two on the surface and two in the basement. It's a roughly 50-50 split between surface yeah. and basement parking and also yeah. between surface and basement cycle parking. This the parking is how many? 27 in total, isn't it, Andy? How many? Seven? 27. 27. 27. It, it complies with the parking standards SPD, including... Visitors. At this point in time, our parking standards, because I Correct. do find that uh, this is one of the problems I have. Thank you, sir. The, the questions have been answered, but I do have concerns about the crampedness of the parking and also the bin area. And I would also ask about... Well, the, hang on, we're not in debate now. Oh, sorry. Uh, Councillor Councillor Tyrrell. It's Councillor Chris Tyrrell here. Thanks, Mr Chairman. Um, just a quick comment on the trees to the north of the site. Um, the land is indeed leased to Bracknell Town Council. It also is um, coming under the protection of policy EV3 of the emerging Bracknell Town Neighbourhood Plan as a local green, a local green space. Um, just to note that. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Councillor Tower. Thank you. Are there any questions apart from that? I can't see. I've still got Councillor Hayes and Councillor Tower's hands up. I'll take it there, legacy hands. Um, I'm to take it down, sir. Yeah, thank you. Um, and I've got no other questions. So therefore, I'll move the officer's recommendation. 
Which, which Chairman is on page 61, uh, complemented by the supplementary on page one. Thank you. Do I have a seconder? Uh, Chairman, I'm happy to second the recommendation. Thank you. Uh, members, uh, as you can see, this is, this is a residential um, development on a brownfield site. Um, and um, I, for one, actually think it's, it's quite attractive. You, you know that I've asked uh, the officer to check with the building, uh, con building materials for the outside, um, but it, it actually is, um, is far superior to what we have there at the moment, which is you know, effectively a piece of wasteland. Um, I'm extremely pleased to see that this applicant hasn't done the normal trick of going one below the affordable housing threshold um, and, has, and has complied with our uh, affordable housing uh, numbers. So that's an even better reason to have this application. Um, and, uh, and I think it's in a sustainable location. I do take on board uh, the comments from Councillor Ballybo with regards to access, um, but you heard from the officer that it may well be that we can achieve um, footpaths under, uh, from the, the sealed payment in section 106. The sec second I wish to speak. Thank you very brief. I'll try and be brief, Chairman, but there's a lot, there's a lot of positives to come out of this planning application. Uh, Bracknell Town Council raised no objections. I'm delighted to see 20% will be electric charging points. Chairman, you've mentioned the affordable housing, which again is a positive. What I would like to, I'd like to compliment Simon on having worked very proactively with the applicant in terms of actually coming up with what I believe is an extremely imaginative scheme, given that this is actually going to be in a very focal position between two main roads. Um, it's in a prominent position. It's, it's highly visible from the highway. Way. I do like the palette of materials that are proposed. And basically what I'd like to say, Chairman, I think this, if it's approved, this will actually be an iconic building and it's one that I fully support. Thank you very much, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Brosnell. Does any other member wish to speak? Uh, yes. Councillor Ballybo. Oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, okay, I'll... I'll... Councillor Ballybo, did you say you wanted yes. to speak on the chat? Yeah, and I'll come yes. to you, Councillor Brown, afterwards. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Simon. I, I, I like this building. I, I, I like it a lot. I like everything about it. I like the space uh, in the apartments. Uh, I like that they've thought about pretty much everything here. And so I want to commend the applicant and also the officers. I think we need this type of apartments for our young people, our key workers and things like that. Uh, the applicant has not try to overdo this and you know put as many things as possible in there. Uh, so I am grateful for that. I'll be supporting the recommendation. I do wish, and I think it's something I, I would like the applicant if they're listening or the officers a lot to consider that path across because whether we like it or not, people are just, they're going to make that uh, path. So it's better to just have that in the plans and light it, uh, put the uh, sort of street lights to make sure it's safe at night to get to South Hill Road because a lot happens in South Hill Road. Uh, so please do consider that. Uh, but overall, I think this is a fantastic scheme. I like the fact that they're keeping a lot of the trees and uh, it will, it's a very good use of the site and a lot of people will benefit. And I believe that whoever lives in this building will really enjoy the environment. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Brown. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I think, you know, my first impression of this was it's brilliant and uh, in, a, in, a, in a good location for a large building and, and screened by trees. But if you look at the um, actual pictures on Google, for instance, uh, you see that the tall trees are quite sparse and uh, the, the drawings we can see are not very representative of the actual position of trees. It also worries me that um, this is a very tall building, five story building on what is higher ground, it's, it's higher than anything else around. And so I think it will be out of place really. I'm sorry to say, I like the building very much and, and everything about it, 
except I, it's too tall in this location. I, I just feel that it is going to be too much, frankly. Thank you, Councillor. Any other member wish to speak? Okay, there's no other members speaking. Um, I'm, uh, I, I take note of Chairman, Council. No, Chairman, I think that there's one more. Uh, Councillor Thomas wishes oh, to speak. Oh, I beg your door. pardon, Councillor Parker. I, I, I missed you. Parker. I, I'm, getting, I'm getting used to this new system, trying to look for hands and for chat. So it's a pleasure. <laughs> That's no me. problem. All right, Councillor Parker. I'll be very quick, don't worry, Chair. I just wanted to say that I think this is a really good use of a brownfield site. Um, and as was alluded to in the officer's report, you know, this site is pretty much a wasteland at the moment. So um, it would be a really good development. It's great we've got affordable housing there. And uh, yeah, I'm gonna support this application. Thank you, Councillor. Okay. Um, yeah, as I, as I was going to say, um, I take on note uh, Councillor Brown's comments. But the fact of the matter is that uh, we heard from the officer that um, even though this is this development is is higher than other surrounding developments, uh, it is sixty metres away from the nearest uh, residential house. Uh, it is surrounded by trees. We can see from the illustration that the trees, in certain instances, are higher than even the proposed height of the building. Um, and, and I have, to my cost, relied on Google Earth or Google Maps to give me an idea. It really depends what time of year it was taken and some of the images are 10 years old. So uh, it's, it, it's not an accurate um, indication of, of, of tree coverage, but we can see that there is, it, is, it is covered. Roadworks on it. Sorry, I'm summing up now. Um, we can see that it is surrounded on all four sides by by trees. Um, so I would ask members to support the officer's recommendation. Can we go to vote, please? Thank you. Councillor Angel. Four. Councillor Dr Barnard. Four. Councillor Bandari. Four. Councillor Burt. Four. Councillor Brossard. Four. Councillor Brown. Abstain. Councillor Dudley. Four. Councillor Badibay. Four. Councillor Green. Four. Councillor Mrs. Hayes. Four. Councillor Hayden. Four. Councillor Mrs. Mackenzie. Four. Councillor Mrs. Mackenzie Boyle. Four. Councillor Mossum. Four. Councillor Parker. Four. Councillor Virgo. Four. That's 15 4 and one abstention, Chair. Thank you. The motion's carried. Uh, we move on then to agenda item eight, which is six Shaftesbury Close. Uh, Olivia. Chairman, I'll just share my screen. Okay, so this is an application for the erection of a detached two-storey dwelling following the demolition of two garages and a stall. Here we have the application site showing the position of the proposed dwelling, the park into the front. And I've got measurements here showing the relationship between the properties, uh, surrounding properties, which I'll go back to when I'm uh, summarizing the planning considerations. Here are the existing floor plans, where we can see the existing property, six shafts through close, next to the two garages and store to be demolished. And here are the proposed floor plans. We'll draw your attention to the fact that the habitable rooms at the first floor are both up to the front of the property. There are no upper storey, side or rear windows that aren't restricted to be obscure glazed and top opening. This is the existing elevations showing six shafts were close and the two garages to be demolished. And here, the proposed development. Now I'll move on to photos showing the relationship of the application site to the surrounding area. This is, sorry, that's too zoomed in. This is a view from the garden of 30 Coningsby. 
towards the application site. So the application, the proposed dwelling <coughs> would be spread over the, the both sides. This these the two garages, and it would be two storey high. Here another view from 30 Coningsby, taken from their seating area, and the application site is here. Another view. And here again from further away into the garden of 30 Coningsby. This is a view from the application site with it's it's on the garage towards the rear properties 30 of uh, uh, um Nightingale Crescent. Sorry, Nightingale Crescent. My apologies, all of these photos are taken from Nightingale Crescent, 30 Nightingale Crescent. Here is a view from 32 Nightingale Crescent towards the application site. So we've got six Shaftesbury Close here, the, uh, the semi-detached property, and the proposed dwelling would be located here. This is the view of the bottom of 32 Nightingale Crescent towards the proposed dwelling. It would be on the left. And here is the garden of 32 Nightingale Crescent. This is the view of the application site. So we've seen the two garages here to be demolished and replaced by a two-story house. Another view showing six shafts to be close with the application site to the right. Another view again from a different angle just to show the relationship to the street scene. And again from the alternate angle and here, further views of the street scene. Further views from the other side. And then this is the opposite side. Oh, no, sorry. This is even further to this. It's showing these properties further down the road, just to show you the position of the application. This is the application site again. Here's another photo of the existing street scenes showing the cars parked in the area. And then here's another view of the existing street scene. So I'll go back to the block plan so I can discuss the planning considerations. In terms of the impact on the character of the area, the proposed development would be designed so that the roof is subordinate to six shafts be close. There would be a modest projection to the front and it would be significantly set back from the neighboring property to the east, number four shafts be close. Given the design is considered in keeping with the surrounding properties and the height and scale of the building are considered in keeping with the surrounding buildings, the design of the property is not considered unduly out of keeping or prominent within the street scene. The application site would be split into two to provide two gardens. There is a section on page 76 of your reports setting out that the size of the proposed garden and application site is in keeping with other gardens within the surrounding area. Therefore, the plot size is also considered not out of keeping with the character of the area. As such, the application is not considered to be unacceptable on these grounds. In terms of the impact on residential amenity, the relationship of the application proposed dwelling to the neighboring properties is, and these are all approximate measurements, 16.5 meters from the rear elevation of the dwelling to the rear elevation of 30 Nightingale Crescent, approximately 8.5 meters from the side elevation of the dwelling to the side elevation of four, Shaftesbury Close, 24 metres from the front elevation of the proposed dwelling to the front elevation of five, Shaftesbury Close. There will be one metre between six Shaftesbury Close and the proposed dwelling, and then approximately eight metres to eight Shaftesbury Close. It is noted that the design guidelines recommend a separation distance of 22 metres rear to rear relationship. However, this recommendation is based on restricting overlooking concerns. 
The proposed development would be restricted by condition to ensure that all windows at upper storeys would be obscure glazed and top opening only. As such, it's considered that the lesser separation distance would be acceptable. The remaining separation distances between the surrounding dwellings is not considered to appear unduly overbearing and loss of light assessments have been undertaken to the surrounding properties and gardens, which have determined no significant impact as a result of the dwelling. In terms of parking, parking spaces, two parking spaces are proposed for the dwelling and two parking spaces proposed to be retained for the existing property six Shaftesbury posts. This complies with our parking standards and will be required to be implemented by condition as such is not considered that the proposed development would increase parking pressures in the area. It is recommended that therefore that the application be deferred to the head of planning for approval subject to signing a legal agreement to ensure financial mitigation against the impact on the Thames Basin Heath Special Protection Area. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Olivia. Do members have any questions? Councillor Ballyboat. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, thank you, Olivia. Good evening again. Uh, currently, I'm looking at Google Maps, sorry to say. Uh, can you just confirm the two garages? Mm -hmm total number of parking space that will be lost if that is converted? Well, um, it is true that the garages will be lost. However, the garages are, first of all, not restricted by planning condition. Therefore, we cannot uh, insist that they be retained. And secondly, although I haven't measured the, the garages, um, they are likely to be uh, substandard given the age of the area. Um, but the, the main point is that um, we could not be in retaining the garages. They could be demolished now without any um, restriction because they're not secured by planning condition and um, sufficient parking spaces have been provided for the new dwelling. Okay. Also, the, are they looking at dropping a curb to park the two, to provide the two car parking spaces in front of the existing property? They certainly would be required to drop the curb. They don't need to apply for planning permission to do this. And that's why it's not part of this application. But we are imposing conditions requiring that these spaces be provided and be accessible. Therefore, a dropped curb will be necessary to comply with the planning conditions on this. Okay, so, but the, the, the two parking spaces, obviously they, they are part of this application that are in front of that uh, building, existing building. So what I'm trying to ascertain is, if you, you showed us a picture of the streets, if you just show us again, I'm looking at the number of cars that are actually parked on the street at the moment, in that picture. Um, this one? Yeah. yeah. So I, if, okay, okay, we can't consider a drop curve. I'm just trying to find that if they drop the curb, we're looking at losing about two parking spaces on the road, roughly. Um, I, I, haven't I, me I haven't measured the length, um, so I wouldn't be able to say, but of course they could drop the curb at, at the moment um, and then provide further parking spaces. We can't. Can I, can I just add, add some information here, please, Councillor Ballyboat? If you look from the plan, you can see that in actual fact, although two garages, which are likely to be substandard, and therefore not counted as parking spaces at the moment are being lost. Um, this application seeks to um, give four additional parking spaces, two in front of each of the properties that are not there at the moment. So although two garages are lost, four additional parking spaces um, will be achieved. And the uh, space in front of the existing garages could not be used as off-street parking at the moment because they would block access to the garages. Yes, yeah, so I'd add to that, Chair, that yes, the area in front of the existing garages obviously has a drop curb already to serve those garages. So the, the additional area of drop curb would serve the two spaces 
replacement spaces in front of the existing dwelling. Um, the spaces are 2.4 meters wide uh, and standard parking space is 4.8 meters long. So you, you're losing approximately one on-street space um, in a location where they could apply to have a dropped curb put in to the front of the existing dwelling in any case and it will be very unlikely to be refused and they could do that without um, a requirement for applying permission to do that because it's not a classified road. Thank you. Uh, just uh, on 9.9, uh, .9, there was reference to number seven, uh, Shazbury Close. Uh, could we, I didn't see that in the picture or it's just not been, it's not been built yet. Ah. So um, it has planning permission. Yes. I don't know if it's been built out yet. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Parker, and then I'll come to Councillor Tarrell. Uh, not me, Chair. I didn't um, ask to oh, speak. Oh, sorry. I beg your pardon. I'm sorry. Councillor Tarrell. Thanks, Mr. Chair. And, um, uh, just on these obscure glazed windows, um, looking um, from the rear of the property, um, what would be the action if uh, they were put in with if something else were put in? Uh, could the person, could the applicant, come back for retrospective planning to get a clear window? Um, oh. Could be enforcement if there was uh, uh, if a clear window was found to have been put in. There well. Enforcement team would investigate if they were notified that a clear glazing had been put in. Um, they would always have the option to put in retrospective um, planning permission or planning permission, but um, of course uh, it could come to the planning committee and be refused if it was considered unacceptable. Okay, th thanks for that. Um, uh, just also, uh, well, no, actually I did have some questions about the parking spaces, but they uh, um, they have been already been asked. Um, uh, so that's all the questions I have now, thanks. Thank you, Councillor Tarrell. Any other member have a question? No, in which case I will move the officer's recommendation. Uh, which which chairman is, is on page 80, uh, supported okay. and complemented by the supplementary on page two. So page 80, the recommendation. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, do I have a seconder? Chairman, I'm happy to second the recommendation. Thank you. Um, does any member wish to speak? Councillor Tarrell. Thanks, Mr Chairman. Um, yes, this is a, a, a curious application. Uh, it, it has aroused um, uh, certain, a, a number of objections um, from neighbours. Um, and the concerns have been raised about parking, but the, um, I think we've been through uh, very carefully what the parking provision is. Um, the uh, um, putting in of an extra property um, has uh, happened at another address in this street, um, and, uh, and I think uh, that's something that, that uh, is, um, is mentioned in, in the report. Um, it's, uh, it's always... I think that another um, aspect of concern to neighbours is the uh, is the rear um, elevations, and and I think uh, the fact it is is being put in quite tightly, um, and the gardens are somewhat narrower than um, originally designed. Um, so I think those are those are very much points for the committee to consider. Um, but uh, you know, as has been drawn out, I think in the presentation, um, there are. Um, in in many ways, this this does not um, exceed uh, our um, our guidelines. So I think this is very much one for the committee to think about and um, and consider in their um, in how they vote. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Brown. Thank you, Chair. Um, I I'm quite unhappy about the fact that this two storeys is suddenly going to be overshadowing the garden at number 30 Nightingale Crescent. Um, but because 
the the garden there is being used for growing and uh, you know the sunshine is important for that I suppose there is no um, provision in planning law about that but um, it is of concern um, I don't I, I guess I can't do a thing about it but I'm unhappy Thank you. Any other member wish to speak? A seconder wish to speak? Sorry. Oh, sorry, Councillor McKenzie Boyle. Sorry, sir, I've, I've lost my piece. I, just to comment, um, I'm always amazed at the ingeniousness of the developers. If you go onto the portal and have a look at uh, one of these uh, uh, proposed units. Thank you. Second, wish to speak. Reserve, Chair. Okay, well, we, we, I'm going to sum up now. Um, okay, this application comes before us because there were a number of objections. However, you can see that it complies with all the policies. It complies with planning. Um, any overlooking has been overcome by the installation of obscure glazing. Um, and... Um, and it isn't very close to the next door neighbour because there are still two or three garages in between the, um, the proposed development site and, and the immediate next door neighbour. I think this is a good use of land and I think it's a good design. I'll just put it to the vote. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Councillor Angel. Four. Councillor Dr Barnard. Four. Councillor Bandari. Four. Councillor Birch. Four. Councillor Brossard. Four. Councillor Brown. Abstain. Councillor Dudley. Four. Councillor Badibe. Four. Councillor Green. Four. Councillor Mrs. Hayes. Four. Councillor Hayden. Four. Councillor Mrs. McKenzie. Four. Councillor Mrs. Mackenzie Boyle. Four. Councillor Mossum. Four. Councillor Parker. Four. Councillor Virgo. Four. That's 15 for and one abstention, Chair. The motion's carried. Thank you. We move on then to agenda item nine, which is Oakham Gates Bracknell. And that's yours, Olivia. Okay. So this is an application for the conversion of amenities and to 12 parking spaces within open gates. This application has been brought to the planning committee as it is an application being promoted by the director of planning place and regeneration. Oh, here we have a plan showing all the spaces um, spread out within open gates, but I think it will be easier to show you uh, the impact by going through the photographs of the location of the sites. So, a red cross where all the sites, the parking spaces will be. So they're proposing to extend this row of bays by one. Include a parking bay here. Two parking bays at the end of this parking area. Two bays at the end of this row of garages and they're retaining the uh, pavement. four bays to the front of these properties, two additional bays at the end of this row. In order to mitigate the loss of soft, the grassed areas, a condition has been recommended for the provision of a landscaping scheme to improve the soft landscaping within the area. The Parking, the location of the parking base has been re reviewed by the highway authority who have no concerns in terms of highway safety. As such, the application is recommended for approval. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Olivia. Does any member wish to ask any questions? Yes, sir, I was trying to get my hand up. It's Dorothy. Yes, Councillor Hodge. Can I ask the question, have the officers inquired about as we can all see the, the usage of the um, parking garages and the rest of it, are any of those just, are they just being uh, left as such? 
Um, unfortunately, I, I didn't investigate this. I, I don't know whether they're being used or not. I don't think it's within the gift of this application to determine whether the garages are in use or not, because yeah. they are um, in separate ownership. Um, I believe that most of them are silver homes, although there are some that are privately owned, um, but it's impossible to tell whether or not the garages are, are in use or not, unfortunately, and not, it not is, in the gift of its application. What is a shame, Andrew, is um, it, uh, the question being, where uh, are we asking then we are taking away greenery where we are would you say leaving ob obstructive places that could be utilized in a lot of cases the garages that are in the new town areas are not to current standards and are in many cases not wide enough to accommodate the modern vehicle types so in a lot of cases they do not get used for parking in any case so they could be utilized for parking if taken down and designed better yeah, yeah. Not, not part of this application to so no, but it's something we should be looking at with regards to taking away what i feel is the greenery as well of the area that's for a separate consideration yes that is yeah. something to think of thank you any other member have any questions Okay, if no other members got any questions, I'll move the officer's recommendation. Uh, Chairman, page 89, with no complimentary supplementary. Thank you. And do you wish to second? Yeah, yeah, happy to do that, Chairman. Okay, any member wish to speak? Yes, sir. Thank you. Councillor Hayes? As I was trying to say just then, it is something I will be taking. I will go with it because... Parking is something of an issue, as I noted on the other application. We must be more concerned about people parking on green areas. But I do think we, we should start looking at the locations whereby we have derelict buildings that should be taken into consideration in planning and the policies, therefore making better use of the area rather than taking away Greenery, greenery, but I will go with you, okay? So and I will start bringing this issue up and other and other ways. Thank you. Thank you, Council Mrs. Hayes. Any other member wish to speak? Okay, as nobody's spoken against it, I'll just put it straight to the vote. All those in favour, please vote when your name is called. Thank you, Councillor Angel. Oh. Councillor Doctor Barnard. Oh. Councillor Bandari. Four. Councillor Burt. Four. Councillor Brossard. Four. Councillor Brown. Four. Councillor Dudley. Four. Councillor Badibo. Four. Councillor Green. Four. Councillor Mrs. Hayes. Four. Councillor Hayden. Four. Councillor Mrs. Mackenzie. Four. Councillor Mrs. Mackenzie Boyle. Four. Councillor Mossum. Four. Councillor Parker. Four. Councillor Burgo. Four. All in favour, Chair. Thank you. The motion's carried. We move to agenda item 10, creation of seven parking spaces at Swaledale. Um, that's you, Chairman. You. Yep, that's me again. Um, okay, yes, so as you say, it's creation of seven parking spaces in Swaledale. It will be the change of use of amenity land to provide these spaces again. So, to show you the plan in context, they're spread out throughout Swaledale. And now here are some photographs. So one space at the end of this existing row, one space at the end of a row of garages. This is a space at the end of a row of garages. Another space, another end, a row of another, another row of garages. Space pro proposed here to enlarge the existing uh, parking area. Here, space shown by the, the van uh, is where another space will be proposed. And then here again, another space at the end of a row of garages. As with the previous scheme, the loss of amenity land will be mitigated by a landscaping plan, which is required by condition. And the highway authorities reviewed the scheme and has raised no concerns in terms of highway safety. As such, the application is recommended for approval. Thank you. Any questions, members? 
Only repeat, we need to yeah. look at seriously. We'll, so we'll okay, take, I will be doing this now. We'll take we'll take that question as read, Councillor Hayes. Any other questions? Then I'll move the officer's recommendation as laid out on page. Sorry, Chair, I, I was a bit mm -hmm. slow in the chat there. <laughs> oh, sorry, Councillor Parker. Sorry, just a really quick question, um, Olivia. You mentioned the landscaping plan. Are you able to give us any further information about what mitigations be put in place? Um, at the moment, the only plan I have is the plan I showed you, showing the location of the spaces. Um, normally, what we would be asking for um, would be shrubbery. Uh, is, is generally the kind of thing we ask for surround, to surround the area, to kind of break up the... Um, uh, the, the hard surfaces is the kind of thing we'd be looking for. Could I request, I know it's slightly out of the um, thing of this meeting, Chair, but Olivia, can I request that when that plan is put in place that the Ward Councillors and myself and Councillor Hamilton yeah. have that shared with us? Thank Absolutely, you. no problem. Thanks. Thank you. Any other member wish to speak? Okay, as nobody's spoken against it, I'll go straight to the vote. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Angel. Oh. Councillor Dr. Barnard. Oh. Councillor Bandari. Oh. Councillor Birch. Four. Oh. Councillor Brossard. Four. Oh. Councillor Brown. Four. Oh. Councillor Dudley. Four. Oh. Councillor Badibo. Four. Oh. Councillor Green. Four. Oh. Councillor Mrs. Hayes. Four. Oh. Councillor Hayden. Four. Oh. Councillor Mrs. Mackenzie. Oh. Councillor Mrs. Mackenzie Boyle. Oh. Councillor Mossum. Oh. Councillor Parker. Four. And Councillor Virgo. Oh. That's all in favour, Chair. That's carried unanimously. Thank you very much indeed. That brings us to the end of this meeting. Thank you everyone for attending. I declare 